Retro Raw 250, March 9th, 1998. Rock and Farouk versus Steve Blackman and Ken Shamrock. Claimed Rock was the self-proclaimed Intercontinental Champion. I don't know what that means. Isn't he the Intercontinental Champion? Well, he had the belt. He has the belt, but I, I think he got it by nefarious means. Did he steal it from Ken Shamrock or something? I've forgotten. I think he stole it from Austin, didn't he? I thought Austin surrendered it. Regardless. Regardless, why were him and Farouk back together? They haven't broke up yet. I know, but they've been... They have been... Of all the two... Of all the men on the nation and team together, they picked these two. I mean, for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, Rock and Farouk have not been getting along. And now this week they come out and they randomly announce that they're back on the same page. Rock has accepted that Farouk is the undisputed leader. Did I miss a show? <laughs> With that said... When did that happen? No. I know what happened at the end, but like what happened that they came out and they told me that? Did I miss something? Seriously. I don't think so, but but with they them... They just said that so that they could do a swerve. Yes. Okay. With them saying that, the nation did all come down as a group and the rock was sauntering down all by himself in the back. Yeah, but he was... That's the point. Right. Like he was deferring to Farouk for no good reason. Well, was he deferring to Farouk, or was he distancing himself from the pack? Right. No, they said he was deferring to Farouk. That's what they said. They said they're all back on the same the page. The point is, they could be doing a better job of making the storyline clear. Yeah, they could be doing a much better job. So they're doing this match, and there's like a strange humming sound and weird lines running across the screen. And the announcers are caught off guard and stop talking and then move on like nothing happened. And two minutes later, it happens again, and Ross apologizes for the technical difficulties. The match was fun while it lasted. Shamrock got a hot tag, and the Nation all hit the ring for the DQ. A common theme tonight. Sucked. First three matches, as a matter of fact. And the last one's on Nitro. You know, this technical difficulties. Oh, my God. <laughs> they do the first time, and the first thing I notice is, have I mentioned how bad Michael Cole is at his job for the last 20 years? This guy can't even... Have you ever seen, like, technical issues on an actual episode of Raw? Like, if they really happen, either they're unacknowledged or Michael Cole would just say, we apologize for the brief technical difficulties. Michael Cole can't do that when they're fake technical difficulties. <laughs> he has to go, what is going on? What is happening? It appears we are having technical difficulties. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus Christ, if I have to listen to this shit all night. So and, all and night, all night there's weird stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And at first I was like, is this the beginning of GTV? Oh, no, it can't oh. be GTV yet. What the hell is it? And then later they do the thing with Kane, and then it's very obvious it's The Undertaker. They did this the whole show to build up Undertaker appearing. Briefly. And then disappearing. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> All of that so that he could appear and vanish. He didn't choke slam anybody. Nope. He didn't cut an angry promo. Nope. He just showed up and left. Yep. <laughs> Spooky. Took his check and went home. I was so furious that that was the payoff. <laughs> I can't even tell you how mad I was. He finally shows up and I'm like, finally, at least we'll get something for this. Then he was gone. And the match sucked. I enjoyed the match. Craig, what do you think? It was fine. Okay. I, I just... You go all over the map on this one. <laughs> hey, I'll praise one thing. This rock could hit the ropes. I didn't notice that too. Rock was running these ropes like a like yeah, a man, like he was a wrestler. Yeah, and not a guy pretending. Yes. So after the match, they're beating up Shamrock, and Rock starts pulling guys off and say, "No, no, I want them all to myself." And so Farouk says, "Okay, fucker," and he orders everyone else out of the ring and up the ramp. So Rock's beating up Shamrock, and then Shamrock makes a comeback, and Farouk stops his men from going in to make the save. They're protesting, but Farouk will have none of this. And it ends with Shamrock putting Rock in the ankle lock at the bottom of the ramp as the nation is at the top of the ramp looking on, not helping. Triple H in China came out for a promo. Hunter's hair in this segment needs its own Hall of Fame induction someday. <laughs> it was amazing. They showed Sean a super kicking Austin last week. And then they introduced a Shawn Michaels promo. <laughs> it said Sean is not here, but... We've got him via satellite. Mm -hmm. And they go to this diner. Right. Dude, they went to like Jose Lothario's diner. That's why I figured it had to be. Some I little don't... tiny diner in the middle of San Antonio. There's nobody there. There's no one there. He's just hanging out in a booth. There's hockey. All the tables are decorated like hockey rinks. 
and there's pictures of skaters on the wall. So whoever owns this place is a not in, big not hockey in Texas, fan. Then. Probably not in Texas. I would Although imagine Sean, they he strolled across the street to the diner <laughs> whatever and took was a there. camera crew with him. Although Sean's cowboy hat in this segment may have been able to be seen from Texas. So Sean, Sean says he has prior commitments. That was his full explanation for why the world champion was not on Raw. Yeah, right. and the way he says it, he just looks around and goes, as you can see. Yes. All I, I have prior was, commitments. All I can see was he was drinking a beer. I was like, <laughs> what do you mean, as I can see? You had to eat? Your prior commitment was sustenance? Chili fries. So he brags about recruiting Mike Tyson in a DX. He says, Steve Austin is just a fad. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm sick, everyone. Fad. Steve Austin's a fad. Sean is going to be around for the long haul. Guarantees he'd win at Mania. He's a ferret. And then they go back to the ring, and there's history. As for the first time, Hunter says he has two words for us, and then they bleeped, suck it. Yeah. I wonder if they do that throughout. History is not... History has not gotten to the point where it is the crotch chop, however, as we cleared up last week. It's that X thing that people do with their hands. That's right. But at least we've gotten to suck it. They showed an empty backstage area where Steve Austin would eventually be. Should note, by the way, that as Craig noted, he was drinking. And this mm -hmm. was not his best promo. I put two and two together. He drank that whole beer and mumbled his way through this promo. Yeah, one beer is going to put Sean on his lips, I'm sure. <laughs> they showed an empty backstage area. There are ways area. where one beer could put Shawn Michaels <laughs> on his ass. Only if you drop some pills in it. What? Anyway, there's more technical difficulties. And we got Owen Hart versus Barry Windham. Owen tried to get in Hunter's face, but Hunter hid behind China. More technical difficulties. Hunter made fun of Owen's big nose. Mm -hmm. And Ross pointed out this hypocrisy. That was funny. Hunter is laughing about getting his title shot, and they say, what are you going to do if Barry Windham wins the European title tonight? And Hunter says, we're not worried about that. And shortly thereafter, China catches Owen with a low blow right in front of the ref of the DQ. So, Barry wins, so he and Jim Cornette are happy. And uh, Owen retains his belt, so Hunter and China are happy. And Owen got hit in the balls, so Hunter's really happy. This match was doomed. Number one, the aging Barry Windham was in it. And number two, Owen the rolled boring his... boring Owen Hart? Owen rolled his ankle to an epic degree in this yeah, they, match. Yeah, I didn't realize it live, and then they heard it. Not just a slow-mo, but a freeze frame of the rolled ankle afterwards, and I cried out in pain. Ugh. Oh. No fun. So Bradshaw ran out to attack Wyndham and send him backing. Jerry Lawler interviewed Paul Bearer and Kane backstage. This was hokey. And as they were talking, but Paul was just talking about how Kane has destroyed Vader. We'll never see him again. Remember I was talking about Michael Cole and how he can't believably express that we've had technical difficulties. He's got a plate up real big. They're back there. And Paul is in the middle of talking. And... I don't even know what they were next to. It was a were bench. They, it was like bench, but you could open up the bench and put stuff in it. Yeah. So, one of them opens and closes magically. Paul Baird can't just keep talking and maybe <laughs> subtly look behind like, what the hell was that? Paul, in the middle of his promo, just goes, stop that! Then he keeps talking. Then he continues talking and it does it again. He goes, stop that! It's like, who are you talking to? Lawler. What the fuck do you think is happening? He thought Lawler's like, doing Lawler's it. kicking the wall as you're doing his speech? Yes. It was a phoniest reaction. And then, because there is no subtlety in WWE, <laughs> every clear. single bench has to open and close repeatedly mm -hmm. so that you know magic's going on here, yeah. in case you missed it. And Lawler and Barra ran for their lives, and Kane just looked unconfused. He didn't look unconfused. Kane knew exactly what was going on. The other two men were scared, but Kane eyeballed it. He knew it was his brother. Just with the one eye, though. Yeah. So I said eyeballed. Instead of eyeballed? Yeah. He didn't eyeballed it. He eyeballed it. <laughs> He's right, you know. I am right. Yeah. Because eyeballs would be weird. Aguilar versus Brian Christopher. They noted Aguila had been dealing with the flu and a 100 plus degree fever all day. I bet Christopher was thrilled Jeez. to be in the ring with this guy. Between this and the supposed, I mean, the giant's neck injury is a storyline. But the giant is so fucking hurt, 
He can't even change his clothes. No. <laughs> He's out there in his fucking street clothes and a neck brace. Yes. They're like, he could not get doctor's clearance and he should not be in the ring. But goddamn, they let him in the ring. Yes. This fucking guy's out here with a 101 degree fever. They're like, this show can't go on without an Aguila Brian no. Christopher match. We cannot delay this till next week. Aguila has to wrestle Brian Christopher on this show. Get your sick ass in there and infect everybody on the roster. He was, we gotta have this fucking He was match. slapping hands on the way down to the ring. Get all the fans sick. <laughs> oh, my God. Typhoid Mary here in the ring. Cannot believe this. He did wear a mask. <laughs> so. Over everything but his mouth. <laughs> Thank you for stepping on the joke, Brian. So they're doing this match. Payback for stepping on my beer yeah. joke earlier. Christopher used the exact same sitting tombstone that nearly killed Steve Austin at SummerSlam. Oh. Not only did they do this match with a man with a fever, it got a shocking amount of time. So, you know, we were talking last week about how Vince has learned his lesson with the light heavyweights or cruiserweights, whatever you want to call them. He would no longer do what they did last week where Taka got killed by Barry Windham for three minutes and died. So, Lawler goes to interfere. The announcer. The 80% retired father of the guy in the ring. Well, he's still a second. I guess he's still a second, but he's certainly not a part of the main roster. What I loved about Lawler being out there was... At first, Taka and Agula come down to the ring together, and I thought it was a tag team match. Then it turns out it's a singles match, and I thought... Or no, before I figured out it was a singles, I saw the two guys in the ring, and I thought, okay, so Taka and Agula are a team. Who the fuck is teaming with Brian Christopher? Later, it turns out it's a singles match, and then I was thinking, well, who the fuck's in Brian Christopher's corner? It's Lawler! They have so few people in this division. Then that's the only person they could come up with to be in Brian Christopher's corner was Lawler. Well, let's go into what Lawler did when he was out here. He went to interfere. Taka went to cut him off. And the retired announcer beat the light heavyweight champion's ass like it was nothing. Dismissed this guy with zero effort. Remember when Daniel Bryan tackled the guy invading his home and said it took zero effort to take him down? Zero effort is what Lawler did to Taka Bitch Noku here. Dead forever. No coming back for this. Well, to be fair, they killed the cruiserweight division on Nitro on the other channel. We'll get to that in a little bit. We'll get to that. No, this is much worse. I don't know what you're talking about now. This is much worse. So anyway, right after that, Lawler gets caught interfering. It's a DQ anyway. This is really stupid. Three non-finishes. Horrible. Matches. Horrible. Are we sure this is better than last week? Yeah, okay. because of the next segment. Oh, you're right. Before we get into the details, I'm just going to tell you that this next segment here, this was the first time since before Survivor Series that I realized why they beat WCW's ass so bad. Every week I've been talking about how both shows are absolutely horrible, and the only reason that WWE won was because WCW was worse. Finally, I have evidence that there was actually something that was way better on Raw than Nitro. Your favorite fuckers, Hulk Hogan and Bischoff, came out a thousand times on that goddamn show. They did. And you compare those two geeks to Steve Austin here eviscerating Vince McMahon in the middle of the ring? Like, no wonder! I finally figured it out! It's Steve Austin! <laughs> Write this down, everyone. My God! Steve Austin was a big part in WWE He was a big winning part of the Attitude Era. Yeah. So Steve he was Austin, a big star and a winner. He was. He was popular. People liked him. Steve Austin arrived at the building and came down to the ring. Let me say one other thing before you get going, Vinny. For those of you that happen to be youngsters and you don't remember the Attitude Era or you've only seen clips, I want you to listen to Vinny describe what happened here and think about Mick Foley and Stephanie <laughs> and every other babyface, your Seth Rollins, every babyface on the Raw roster and the way they're treated by Stephanie McMahon. Let's talk about what happened with Steve Austin and Vince and all the rest of the geeks. Preach, Brian. So as Steve is making his way to the ring, the announcers are talking. First of all, A, this is basically the first time we've seen him since we have found, found out Mike Tyson joined DX. Uh, last time we saw Steve, was getting super kicked in the mouth by Shawn Michaels. Since then, we are then told, Austin has had a confrontation with WWF officials at the airport, and he also skipped a photo shoot earlier that afternoon. So he gets in the ring and he's pissed. He says, Vincent Mann... Actually, he, had a, he showed a video of Vincent Mann calling Mike Tyson the baddest man on the planet. Had him play this three or four times in a row. Says, that is an insult to me. Now let me stop you there. He doesn't even care 
that the special enforcer in the match has joined the bad guys. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give a shit. No. He's mad that Vince McMahon had the temerity to say that Mike Tyson was the baddest man on the planet. And not Austin. That's the only thing he's mad about. He's not even bitching that it's totally unfair. He doesn't care. He'll beat up a hundred men. Vince actually said, unquestionably, the baddest man on the planet. Yes. So Austin grabs a chair, says, I'm going to sit here all night until Vince comes out to talk to me. By the way, Steve Austin, the only man who ever who could look badass in a fanny pack. So out comes Gerald Briscoe and Jack Lanza. They try to get Austin to come backstage. He just refuses. He pays them no mind. So they leave. Out comes Sergeant Slaughter. At which point Austin says, quote, Ladies and gentlemen, this is a rib. <laughs> Sarge obviously can't get Austin to leave either. They cut backstage. Vince is exasperated, trying to figure out what to do, taking advice from everyone, not giving orders to anyone, trying to just try to get a game plan. So Sarge is out there yelling at Austin. Austin says, hey, Mania is just around the corner. You're not firing me. You're not suspending me. There's nothing you can do. They go to commercial. They come back. Now they are trying Pat Patterson and the shortest, fattest, oldest security guards you ever saw. Dude, I don't know if Austin knew the old guy was going to be out there. Well, man, he took one look at that guy, and he had material for days. He did. They had a 90-year-old security guy that was out there getting ready to attempt to remove Steve Austin from the ring. Yeah. God, Austin had a field day. He had a field day with this guy. Was uh, starting to knock out his last teeth, I think he said. Yeah. <laughs> Among other things. He said, I don't care if you're 18 or 81, I'll beat your ass. Yeah, and you were definitely and the latter. talking he about said, you. Yeah. So eventually, they all gave up and left. There's nothing Patterson could do. So Patterson leaves, and Vince finally there's nothing else to do. Vince makes his way down to ringside. Austin calls him into the ring and says, Listen, I spent a year calling myself the world's toughest son of a bitch. And then you go and pull the carpet right off from under me by blowing smoke at Mike Tyson's ass. So Vince is out there. He has what appears to be Andre the Giant's jacket and a shirt collar from the 1970s. Looked like he was ready to take flight. Very calmly trying to explain. And I, I imagine Vince has had conversations very much like this about a thousand times in real life. Vince is trying to calm him down, saying, look, it's just a figure of speech. Baddest man on the planet, it's just a figure of speech. So Austin asks, asks point blank, do you want me to be champion? No. First, when Vince says, it's just a figure of speech, Austin says, well, here's a figure of speech. And he flips him off. The look on Vince McMahon's face oh, yeah. also made the Attitude Era. It did. He was a perfect foil for this guy. So Austin asks, do you want me to be champion? Vince won't answer. Vince starts to leave, says this is nonsense, and starts to go. Austin calls him back, dares him to fight, offers Vince a free shot, puts his hands down, leans his chin out, dares Vince to take a shot. Vince obviously won't do it. And then we learned why Vince was wearing this jacket as Austin reached out and started tearing it apart. So I'm sure for this segment, when they had this idea, Vince went home, went into his closet, found it, the ugliest jacket in there, <laughs> and pulled it out and put it on. So this is the jacket that will be torn up for a TV segment. I love that this cheap bastard had to use a cheap suit to get ripped up. Absolutely. He couldn't come out in a nice one. So Austin's like reaching out, grabbing the pockets and tearing them up. And Vince is just appalled. He doesn't know what to do. He's beside himself. And finally, Austin just gives him 10 seconds. You can hit me or get out of the ring. And given those two options, Vince got out of the ring. So they all left, and Austin says he knows for a fact now that Vince, DX, and Mike Tyson are all in this together. They're all working together to make sure he's never champion. He's going to kick Triple H's ass tonight. Sean's not here, so I'll have to wait to kick Sean's ass at Mania. And that was that. So, so awesome. Everybody in the audience was on their feet through this whole thing. This is not a shocking revelation, but for 19 years... I have had to watch all of these companies do the heel GM angle over and over and over and over and over again. And it's like everybody's forgotten that the whole reason it worked was because Steve Austin was the blue collar hard worker. Vince was the boss. Everybody hates their boss. And here, here. he did to their boss what they wanted to do to their boss. Is this that hard? Listen, I don't have a boss. I'm the boss. But I used to have bosses. I won't mention any names. But man, I had bosses that 
These fuckers. <laughs> Everybody. Whether you like your boss now or not, at some point in your life, if you've had more than one job, there's a pretty goddamn good chance that you've thought, you fucker, to your boss. Who in the fuck wants to sit down on a Monday night, watch three goddamn hours of wrestling, and have to relive their day at work? Mm, I don't know. Where their boss is there shouting down all the baby faces, and the baby faces have to go, Oh, you're right. I was so wrong. And their boss treats them like an idiot, and there's nothing they can do about it. Because the boss tells all the baby faces, if you don't do what I'm saying, I'm going to fucking fire you, and you're going to be out on the street. Who the fuck would want to do that every Monday night? How? Is this that hard to figure out? Apparently. This went really, really long. But it was awesome. But it was awesome. It did. Although you bring up the point I was going to make next. Mm hmm Brian also had a good point about how everyone's tried to steal the heel GM angle and done, and done it wrong and badly and poorly. But sometimes I think that Steve Austin was so great that he could do 20-minute promos and right. they would be awesome. But people learned then, they, they did not get the lesson that Steve Austin is awesome 20-minute 20, 20 promos. They got the lesson... 20 minute promos are awesome. <laughs> yes, this yeah. is this is the this is the deal with the Rock. Rock is there also. The Rock did a bunch of fucking jobs for everybody. It didn't hurt him. And so for 19 years, I've watched everybody do a million jobs and no one's over because there's one Rock. Yeah. Fucking Daniel Bryan. How many times have they tried to recreate Daniel Bryan? It fails every fucking time because it worked with one guy, Daniel Bryan, and Honestly, they were actually trying to bury the guy. Yes. <laughs> they weren't trying to get the guy over. He got over in spite of it. You can't do that with anybody else. God damn, I just think about Stephanie eviscerating all of these people. For years now. And it's like, no one wants to see the boss get one over on the employee. On every fucking show. Yeah. <laughs> like, I remember a while ago I was thinking, when's the last time Stephanie got hers? When Vicky Guerrero threw her in the mud? I believe so, yes. That was like five fucking years ago. Yeah, Ronda Rousey, almost two years ago. Mm. And then... She's not employed, though. That's true. Yeah, she's not employed. She was an outsider. Then I was thinking, remember when she feuded with Brie Bella and they had that match at SummerSlam? Oof. I guess that was the last time. But then someone reminded me, actually. Stephanie won that match! Like Foley's going to get some revenge. <laughs> he ain't going to get revenge. Yeah, it sounds like Foley's going to ball up his fist and punch her in the mouth. He's been treated like an utter loser. He's going to be fired, and Maybe she's going to laugh. Will debut. Noelle will debut and fight her father's battle. Ooh. Oh, yeah. She would Stephanie dress Stephanie's going to put over, yeah. <laughs> Idiotic. Quebecers versus Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie. This was weird. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> they had Chainsaw Charlie, Babyface, and Barrel. Yeah, they, they followed Kinda. up that Austin <laughs> segment with this. Yeah. So it was quite odd and clunky. Jack got a hot tag. We got a four-way with moonsaults and top rope ranas by these big old men. <laughs> Crowd didn't care about any of it. And the Quebecers missed a corner charge, and Jack had a double arm DDT and won. A mess of a match is what I wrote. Road Dog comes out with his arm in a sling. By the way, if Brie Bella had been Stephanie, that was 2014. <laughs> so he'd be going on three years. Yeah. And she didn't. So Rod, Road Dog comes out with his arm in a sling. He says, you guys did this to me. If you got any balls, here, come fight. So Jack obliges. He goes charging up the ramp, but this lets Billy Gunn zoom in from behind. He whacks Charlie with a chair and runs away, then cuts a promo warning Cactus to never leave Charlie's side again. So they have painted this now as Chainsaw is the old wink leak, weak link of the team. I and like wink link. Or wink leak, whatever. Wiki leaks, I don't care. Uh, anyway, the point is, he's also Jack's hero. So they've... Uh, Warned at Jack that if he doesn't fuck around, his hero's going to get hurt, not just himself. Paul, Bear, and Kane came out for a promo. Bear went off about what a mistake Taker had made by returning. Said, you have stepped into an inferno, and this is not a game. Lights went out. Taker's gong sounded. Taker's dong. Taker is in the ring. Kane goes after him. Lights go out. I don't know why. It took Taker like three or four seconds to get into the ring. But it felt like it took about 25 to get out of the ring. Regardless, the lights come back up. Taker is gone. That's it. And Bearer warns again, this is not a game. And at Mania, Taker will face his brother eye to one eye. And he can go back to the dark side, never to return. 
cool. The cartoon portion of the show has not ended. I was going to say this next is the the dirty cartoon portion of the show. That's true. Goldust versus Mark Merrill. This feud is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> So Goldust comes out and he's just gold dust this week. No Dusty Rhodes or bondage gear. He's just gold, gold dust. dust. Well, yeah. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> this is very low on the weird scale. So the gimmick is, is gold dust versus Marrow with Luna and Sable handcuffed to the posts in their corners. So Marrow is chasing gold dust. By the way, it's Mark Marrow wrestling gold dust. So of course the fans don't care who's winning. Marrow is tripped by Luna as he's chasing Goldust, which I guess is the heat. At this point, they start talking about WrestleMania, how you've got to buy it. And by the way, folks, when you call your cable company, make sure you order WrestleMania on pay-per-view by name. Mm -hmm. I heard this and I thought about it and I said, are you telling me? Yes. There are fans who are accidentally ordering WCW pay-per-views. I want the wrestling <laughs> program. And then I thought about it and I did a pretty much that same voice in my head. And I said, yeah. okay, yeah, I can see that. Or what actually is more likely is Vince was sitting there going, God damn, how do they keep beating us on pay-per-view? <laughs> it's got to be a mistake. <laughs> it must Both. be these shitheads <laughs> ordering the wrong show. It's the only answer. Either of these makes sense when you think about it. What so, pay-per-view? Like, it would be one thing if there was a Wrestle War at the same time as WrestleMania. Yeah. But it was like Spring Stampede. How do you fuck this up? No, I'm with Craig. They just called up and said, I want to see the wrestling. A yokel. So the ref gets bumped. Goldust hits Mero with a curtain call. Leg drops the ref. Steals the keys. He teases uncuffing Sable. And Sable here acted so dumb <laughs> that she believed him. Instead, he unle unleashed Luna. <laughs> Listen, I got to put over Sable, okay? This was the best Sable ever. When Goldust teased freeing her she could have yelled and screamed at him but she would have ensured that he wasn't going to free her so instead she got all nice she flirted with oh him. here <laughs> here see. are my boobies yeah, yeah. you I want see. to unlock me hey come on baby i didn't take it that way he didn't fall for it interesting yeah. I now here's that way. here's the best thing so luna gets released yes <laughs> and she goes over and she's attacking sable and Gold Dust starts giving Luna something. And it looked like, you know when you stay at a hotel and they have the little soap? Yeah, yeah. I thought that's what it was. I was like, they're putting soap in her mouth? Like, that's the big <laughs> attack? Turns out, it's makeup. Mm -hmm. They're putting makeup on her. They're painting her up. And so they're painting her up, and she's yelling, and she's struggling, and they're putting makeup on her, and she's screaming, and she's struggling. And then Luna grabs a cup of water and throws it right in her face. And Sable just stops. That was too much. She's so fuming mad that she just stops. Like, she can't believe what has just happened. I totally understood. I was going to say, this is for Brian it was. speaking. I was like, I yeah. get it. I get it. This is the proper response to water being... That's the ultimate. That is the ultimate. So... Goldust takes Luna away. Mero comes to, asks what happened. He's fine now, by the way. Sure. He was unconscious for three minutes as a result of this curtain call, but mm -hmm. now he's fine. They unleash Sable. She goes charging her. Unleash is I keep right. saying that. That's no, true. she was unleashed. Yeah. She was in a fury. Yeah, and she was literally screaming backstage to kill Goldust and Luna. I liked it. I thought that Sable did a great job here. It was a great way to get heat on Sable, who was not a trained wrestler. You couldn't beat her up. You couldn't have Luna put her through a table or something. It was a way to humiliate her and have her... Some... Yeah, but the point is, Sable did such a good job. On paper, someone put paint on her face. Right. <laughs> but she made it seem like the most atrocious thing that you could have possibly done to her. Sure. You believed she was furious about someone putting fucking makeup on her. Who <laughs> gives a shit? But she made you give a shit about it. Yes. Good job, Sable. We had a Mike Tyson video package, focusing on all the mainstream press he got, including future Yama ring announcer Scott Farrell. God. <laughs> you know what I loved about the Tyson interview? Jim Ross is talking to him like he's a child. And at first I was kind of like, do you have to talk to the poor guy like he's an infant? 
And then Tyson starts to answer. Yeah, he talks like one. <laughs> I was like, he is an infant. And this was perfect. So Ross asks how, uh, or Tyson admits Austin had pissed him off by flipping him off. He says, uh, ask how can you be a fair official now that you've associated yourself with DX and Shawn Michaels? Tyson says, life's not fair. Nobody's treating me fairly. Fair is winning. And he gets up and he walks off. Triple H versus Savio Vega in the main event. I wrote that in all caps, <laughs> bolded. Those exact words. I was like, on a show where you did that Vince McMahon Austin angle that was so awesome, this was your fucking main event? What are you thinking? Yeah. Death well, TV. It went 10 seconds. It's funny. The Barricos are out there and like 20 officials and the Lanzas and Pattersons and Slaughters are all out there. To, cause Surrounding the ring. Austin had said he's going to come out and kill Triple H later. So... They're out there to stop Boston from killing Triple H. Ten seconds in, Austin comes out to kill Triple H. He just pushes them all aside and gets into the ring. And he gets in there. He stuns a ref. He stuns a Briscoe. He stuns Savio. And then Shawn Michaels appears out of nowhere and drops him with a super kick. Got him again. Now, if you watch this, he hits a super kick. And boy, was he fucked up after that super kick. He grabs his hip. He starts limping. Mm. He grabs his back. This guy was a mess. Yeah. Should have drank another bottle of beer. So they're triple teaming Austin. And they had this all set up perfectly because Hunter's holding Austin. Sean's got a chair and there's a ref behind Sean. And Sean rears back with a chair and that's exactly where the show ends. And then, of course, in real life, the ref probably grabbed the chair so Austin didn't have to, didn't have to take a pointless chair shot. But yeah, the stuff with Steve Austin was really good. Sure was. Saved this show. If you would have taken that off this show... Mm. Mm, 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 mm. Man, oh man. It really is amazing. I've said it before. This is why Vince won't give up on Roman Reigns. Because it takes one single solitary guy getting over. So turn it all around. One fucking guy. We don't have that guy right now. Wait, Raw? The much less interesting show, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken Shamrock came out for a promo. So the story here is that Ken Shamrock would dominate The Rock as long as he can control his temper. And he immediately in this prom promo... As long as he could control his temper. Yeah. That's, what he that's said. the storyline. Yeah. yeah. Well, and he couldn't he, control his temper. He immediately, in this promo, pointed out how dumb this was, saying, I've been in no-holds-barred fighting all over the world for years, and my temper was never a problem there. It's funny, because his temper is always a problem in pro wrestling. Yes. Only there. He vowed to win the IC title at Mania. The nation came out to interrupt, and Rock issued a challenge. If Shamrock could last two minutes with any member of the nation, then Rock would grant him an intercontinental title match tonight. Then he volunteered at D'Lo to give Shamrock this test. Now, obviously, I love The Rock and everything like this, but he totally fucked this up. He was supposed to say, if you can beat anybody in the nation of domination in two minutes... Then you get a championship match. Instead, he said, if you can last two minutes, mm -hmm. then they fucked it up and put a clock on the screen. Of course, he could last two minutes. The key was, could he beat the man? But he did beat him, and it didn't matter. And the, yeah, but the point is, he fucked up his promo. Because even The Rock can screw up a promo. So D'Lo came down to the ring. Shamrock A told him to shut his monkey ass up. That's a quote. That won't fly in 2017. Later, he called, in the same promo, he called him a little monkey. Twice. Yeah. I think uh, Howard Cosell got fired for saying almost the exact same words. Like 15 years before this. Right. Yeah. So, had this short little match. Crowd hated Rock, of course. And then with 18 seconds left, Shamrock took the ankle off. It hooked the ankle lock. Or tore his ankle off. Either way. It's effective either way. Yeah. And uh, Rock hit Shamrock in the back with a chair for the DQ. And then Shamrock, from his knees, said, Hey, why don't you hit me in the head? Rock said, Okay. And with zeal and enthusiasm, hit this man in the head with a steel chair as hard as he possibly could. Dude, I love The Rock, but my God. How many guys are you going to try and kill with chair shots in your career? Like Dude, Shamrock twice in the past couple months. Countless. Yeah. Now, I guess, I sort of, here's the thing. Ken Shamrock's a crazy dude, and I'm sure that before the show, Ken said, listen, just fucking swing that chair. I'm Ken Shamrock, dude. 
I'm an MMA fighter. Just swing that chair in my head hard as you can. Now, if somebody said that to me, I'm not going to swing that chair as hard as I can because I care for my fellow human. Mm. Not saying that Rock doesn't care for his fellow human, but he sure is fucked in in this angle right here. Swings his chair like a baseball bat, and sure as shit, he knocks Ken Shamrock out. They said, Ken Shamrock's unconscious. That was true! And split him open. Knock this dude out, Ken Shamrock goes to the hospital. So I hope Ken Shamrock learned a lesson here about telling The Rock, a six foot four, 280 pound Samoan, to swing a chair as hard as he could at his head. So if Bad a, idea. If you have a friend that loses his temper often, the solution is hit him in the face with a chair. That's not the solution. Horrible advice. What are you talking about? Well, it's what worked here. So Farouk and Rock bickered afterwards, and uh, Farouk took the chair away. So they go to commercial. They come back. EMTs attending to Shamrock backstage. He was bleeding from the side of the head, and, you know, if I didn't know better, I'd have thought he had a concussion here. Shocking. He really sold it well. He really did sell that very well on the way to the medical facility. Sable came out for a promo. Short and sweet. Challenged Luna to a fight. Threatened to kick her ass. So the big thing now is Sable always keeps calling her a bitch, which is an easy pop. Sable comes out and she says that she wants a fight on the show tonight. She goes backstage. Later in the show, Luna does a promo and she accepts the challenge. I will fight you tonight. Now, if I recall correctly, a couple of weeks ago, Shawn Michaels and Mike Tyson had a near brawl and a bunch of geeks came down and they separated them. Correct. Then Mike Tyson and Shawn Michaels agreed that they would have a fight and the geeks got out of the ring and allowed them to have a fight. Also correct. Which led to Mike Tyson tearing off his shirt and joining DX. So knowing that those are the rules, how come when Sable challenged Luna and Luna accepted the challenge, why did Sable come out for the main event and the geeks immediately ran down to not let them fight? Can anyone explain this to me? No. Blank stares? No. All no, right, no. thank you. In fact, I'll have more to say about that when it happens. So they were in Phoenix. The Phoenix basketball team has a gorilla for a mascot. And the gorilla dropped down from the ceiling much like Sting, in fact, and ran into the ring, started taking wacky bumps and left and high-fived all the fans, and he joined the announce desk, which is funny, because he's mute. Tom Brandy versus Jeff Jarrett. Tennessee, Tennessee Lee introduces Elvis Presley and says, no, wait, it's even better. <laughs> and out comes Double J on a horse. I mentioned this. Not better ago. than Elvis Presley. You know, I didn't believe that they did it on this run, but you were right. He came out on a fucking horse with a blinking jacket. Mm -hmm. <sighs> <laughs> Hat lit up like a billboard. Perhaps can you, you can... imagine that they went to all that trouble to sit this guy down when he came back? They paid him all this money. He does an interview with Jim Ross. He talks about how absolutely stupid the Double J character was. And then... They immediately turn him back into Double J, and they make it worse by giving him a horse. Even, <laughs> even more than that, when he was gone, they took his roadie and did a whole big angle about how Double J was a fake the whole time. That's right. So Double J's back. Rush than Tom Brandy, who sucks. There's a horrible neck breaker where Jarrett's head somehow ended up like in Brandy's lap almost. Tried to get himself stuck in the tree of woe, got stuck in the middle rope instead. Jarrett wins with the figure four, and everyone's celebrating, and then you clearly hear somebody say, probably Brandy, fuck! <laughs> I thought I was the only one that heard that. No. How the I, fuck could you be the only one to hear that? You it was hear it so loud. Without having the network, you can just hear it. If you hold your hand to your ear on a clear like, day. <laughs> if you weren't paying attention, you still would have heard it. Yes. Well, he was right. <laughs> oh, Tom Brandy's all mad that he did a job for Jeff Jarrett. Well, I suspect he's mad because his match sucked and he knew it. He did a job for Jeff Jarrett who rode down on a horse with a billboard on his hat that blinked Jeff Jarrett. Yeah, clearly that guy's the star. You're going to put him over. Sure. And his horse. Yeah. Horse should have gone over. Backstage, Kevin Kelly told us that Shamrock was going to the hospital, but then Rock interrupted. He said, well, 
Shamrock's out of the picture, WWF now has the very difficult task of finding me a new worthy challenger for WrestleMania. Hey, at least he's smarter than Gallows and Anderson. At least he didn't go over there and say, well, looks like I don't have a match for WrestleMania. I'll just sit out the big show of the year. <laughs> nice. I don't need that payday. I don't need that WrestleMania moment. I'm happy just doing matches on Raw. Ready, Shawn Michaels video package. All right. This was awesome. This was an all-time. Listen to me, everybody. This was an all-time classic video. I don't care what anybody says. I know that they make great videos. I know that over the last 20 years, we've seen a bunch of awesome video packages for pay-per-views and that sort of thing. But let me tell you something. This one was an all-time classic. I can even quantify it. They're about to start beating Nitro in the ratings. They're about to start turning their business around. They're about to get to the point where they can go public and Vince can become a billionaire. All of this, obviously, was not because of Shawn Michaels. It was because of Stone Cold Steve Austin. But you know what? When you're a babyface, you've got to have a great heel foil. And Shawn Michaels, I remember... Some of you will find this hard to believe, some of you youngsters... But I remember the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame when Shawn Michaels was eligible on the ballot, and he didn't go in the first year. And I don't think he went in the second year or the third year. I can't remember how many years it was before this guy went in. But there were so many people who did not want to see Shawn Michaels go into the Hall of Fame. They hated this guy. Now granted, Shawn Michaels was a very controversial fella. And during this period, he wasn't exactly the nicest fella. And there was a lot of things that he did. He never dropped titles. He tried to never do jobs. I mean, you could make many arguments for this man not going to the Hall of Fame. Nowadays, it's preposterous, the idea that Shawn Michaels wouldn't be in the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame. But the fact of the matter was, this guy was such a hateable, unlikable guy that he was a perfect heel foil for Stone Cold Steve Austin. And this was a video package building him up for WrestleMania and the match with Steve Austin and the championship win that turned everything around for this company this was a classic video package an all-time fucking classic and it was awesome they had uh clips of sean doing spectacular moves and in cutting promos all laid over this david gilmore-esque guitar soloing <laughs> in the background it was it was moving it was the very best of Shawn michaels which makes it among the very best of professional wrestling you will ever see and uh, Brian made a great point. The whole thing was to set this up as a... To set Sean up as the rival of Steve Austin. So while Steve Austin, as we would later see, was the work, the blue-collar working man, Sean was all about arrogance and flashy and showing himself off. From the Sean Michaels video package, we go to the Headbangers. Now, I will say, may have been the best Headbangers match I ever saw. Do you know why? Because it had the Rock and Roll Express in it, and they're awesome. It was the Rock and Roll Express and Haven't Jim they Cornette. wrestled the this Rock and Roll the, Express before? This is the Where have you been, dude? Time they have wrestled the Rock and Roll Express. Were the others this good? No. This was two minutes and seven seconds. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck were you watching here? I was watching a good match with a fucked up finish because the Headbangers, even their best match, can't get their finish right. Ever. Their finish. Yeah. It's their finish and they can't do it. They always fuck it up. Every single time. Amazing. So technically it was a handicap match with Jim Cornette on the heel side because... Cornette had gotten involved in a wacky angle on Superstars. It doesn't matter. They did a two-minute match. Uh, the Rock and Roll Express sold the whole time. It got the heat for 15 seconds. And then the Headbangers blew their finish and won. At this point, out came the, uh, <laughs> the Headbangers went after Cornette. Went out run Bart Gunn and Bob Holly. They came out. They hit the ring. They got matching gear. Bob Holly bleached his hair. <laughs> fucking Bob Holly, yeah. bleached blonde long mullet and they got M.E. on their trunks M.E. me and I'm like what the fuck was their team name M.E. mm-hmm M main eventers main event no it's not main event massive Is egos main event so anyway male enhancement massive whatever no. and suddenly suddenly I was like no. Yeah. Now listen, when I was a youngster, when I first started watching wrestling, I watched WWF. 
I watched all WWF until about 91, 92. I started watching NWA, WCW. I miss the heyday of the Midnight Express. Hmm. But now we have gone back. We have been watching the Midnight Express every single week on television. We have been watching the great Bobby Eaton. We have been watching his tag team partner, the ugliest man of all time, Dennis fucking Condry. The two greatest fucking guys ever. And when I saw this through the eyes that I have now, Bob Hawley and Bart Gunn oh, no. as the new Midnight Express, I was like, who the fuck came up with this idea? And listen, I like Bob Hawley. But I was like, you're the new Midnight Express? Like, are they trying to kill your career? What's going on here? Brian, it's Bodacious Bob. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's Bodacious Dude, Bob. Dude, they're talking about Bodacious Bob. And Bombastic and Bombastic Bart. Bombastic Bart. And Bart is just... The look on his face <laughs> as they're calling him Bombastic Bart. He can barely contain himself. Like, what the fuck am I doing out here? Bombastic Bart... Not one time in my life has anyone ever called me anything resembling fucking bombastic. And I gotta be out here doing this fucking gimmick. I can only imagine. I'm sure Cornette liked the guys. But Jesus, God, Cornette coming back and that's his new Midnight Express. And they, WWF didn't learn their lesson when they brought in the new rockers. Of course they didn't. They never learned their lesson. So, Bob and Bart beat up the headbangers. And Cornet introduced them, and he said, The problem is, I've, the headbangers are still tag champs, and people are still putting their hands on me, and that's your fault! And he points to the Rock and Rolls, and the Midnight Express laid them out as well. So that probably ends the Rock and Roll Express's WWF 1998 run, and that makes me sad. Jennifer Flowers, who was doing an appearance at Mania, did a video, the point of which was making it very clear she wants to fuck Shawn Michaels, Steve Austin, and The Undertaker. Jennifer Flowers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. God bless her. G get the most out of that 50 minutes. Good looking 70 year old woman. Yeah, <laughs> 70 like, what today. What the hell is going on with Jeez. this show? <laughs> they went from Pamela Anderson to Jennifer Flowers. They did do that. Had Jenny McCarthy right? too. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> so the gorilla was in the ring being wacky. And the lights went out. Kane came down. And the gorilla got choke slammed and tombstone, and of course the crowd hated that because he was their guy. Owen Hart came out to do commentary. <laughs> Kinda. He was uh, there. God bless the guy. His foot was in an air cast after, after rolling his ankle last week. He had pretty much nothing to say the whole time he was out there, other than the very, very obvious stuff. Like just, just he it was he was like the guy who describes the show to someone who's watching who is blind and can actually see. Those things like, oh, Billy's punching him now. Thanks, Owen. Got it. I still can't get over the new Midnight Express. <sighs> Listen, Bart Gunn's WWE <laughs> run was like a disaster, but Bob Hawley... Sp sparky plug? Like, the worst thing that you can do is have to follow a great act. Yeah. Now, Bob Hawley was like... A great, gruff, angry bully. He's a bully character. Now, Bob denies that he was a bully in real life. If you've ever read Bob's book, the book's awesome. Bob feels that he is misunderstood, or he has been misunderstood over the years. But whatever you think about Bob, I mean, he was never designed to be Bobby Eaton. Right? Not in the ring. Bart Gunn. They're both Alabama rednecks. Bart Gunn was never, never in a million years would he be able to be Dennis Condry. But no. both guys could be great. Maybe not Bart, but like <laughs> Billy could be a great. Bart was great as Billy Gunn's tag team. Partner. Yeah, Bob Holly. Bob Holly could be a great Bob Holly, but he's a terrible Bobby Eaton. Yes. Why do they insist on doing this? Al fucking Snow as a rocker. Right. Got me. Like what? You think you just give people gimmicks and they work? Is that what they thought? I mean, obviously they did. But it's so stupid. Like, is this stuff... I don't get it. How can you be Vince McMahon and be so goddamn brilliant 
and so stupid at the same time. It blows my mind. Bob Holly thinks he's misunderstood. Kane was a fucking dentist. Like, you know what you're going to be great at, Glenn? We're going to have you be a dentist. Mm. Like, you're going to come out and work on people's teeth. By the way, a dentist with green stuff in his teeth. Well, that was the comedy. I see. But a dentist, a fucking hog farmer? What am I missing? A race car driver? Remember when Bob Holly was a race car driver? I think I brought it up just a minute ago. Now, granted, he could drive cars. So at least, you know, he was a race car driver. But hey. what the hell does that have to do with wrestling? How do you translate that character to the wrestling ring? I can drive a car, too. I still can't get over this. You've overlooked the goon. The goon? The plumber. Right. But at least, like, hold on. At least the goon was a hockey guy. They're fucking tough. Mm. Sure. A fucking plumber? <laughs> I'm sure they're tough plumbers. The trash collector? Yeah, trash collector. Duke the dumpster. I'm good at pushing that button that lifts the goddamn trash can onto the back of the thing. So goddamn it, I can go in there and wrestle on my on weekdays. I'm sure there's more we're missing. It's just so dumb. There's that whole era where every every guy on Raw mm -hmm. had, had a day to have job. some stupid gimmick. It wasn't even a gimmick because they, they had a day job and they wrestled on the side. Isn't it funny when the company was like making no money, the wrestlers all had characters that had day jobs. Yeah. It's fucking weird. Yes. Why do they... Uh, Eh, fuck it. Dolph Ziggler thinks he's a comedian? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. No, he... Well. <laughs> so, Chainsaw Charlie wrestled Billy Gunn. Road Dog had a house mic, was doing live play-by-play. -play, which was great when Charlie made his comeback and a DDT and Road Dog screamed, No! <laughs> and he attacked Charlie with a belt for the DQ. So, Charlie makes his own comeback. DDT is Billy on a title belt. And then Cactus Jack... Now, they did a gimmick last week where Charlie was left alone, and so they killed him, and so he's been established as the weak link of the team now. I guess they figured they'd change their mind, because here, Jack, or Charlie beat them both up by himself, and then Jack just came down after the fight was over. So, Road Dog tries to flee, Charlie runs him down, and then something totally insane happened. As Chainsaw Charlie, Terry Funk with pantyhose on his head, had to attach a harness to Road Dog's feet... Oh my god. So that road dog then be suspended by his feet up in the air. <laughs> now, before we get to the harness, I just want to mention, can you imagine if somebody turned Chris Benoit into a member of the Midnight Express? Or better yet, what if they needed a new Rock and Roll Express and they were like, you know who's the man for this job? Fucking Chris Benoit. Would that not be idiotic? That'd be idiotic, bro. Thank you. That'd be a horrible decision to make back in 1998. Dude, this is bothering me a lot. Now, let's talk about this hog tie-in. So Mick Foley's at the top of the ramp, and Mick and Terry Funk is at the bottom of the ramp, mm -hmm. and <laughs> they're trying to make me believe <laughs> that they've jimmied a system where there's the rope hanging above the bottom of the ramp, yeah. and it goes straight up to like a pulley system, yes. and it goes across all the way, the spanning the ramp, and then it goes down, and Cactus Jack oh, has got the other end. At the top right. of the stage, yes. So the best part is a stage hand right. hands chainsaw this apparatus. Hog tie apparatus. Uh -huh. Like you can't you couldn't even miss that. This is genius actually because they had to sneak into the building in hopes. No, there wasn't sneaking. Clearly it's a conspiracy involving the people that set everything this up. This is Elmer Fudd style trap setting. No. At the, its best. The stage hands were all involved. They give it to Cac or to whatever his name is, Chainsaw. He ties the dude's legs up, and they literally lift this guy mm -hmm. up into the air by his feet. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out which was more dangerous, this or Sting dropping out of a fucking helicopter. Not this. Onto a ring oh, I don't know. in the water. <laughs> and the best part is, if I'm being pulled up by my feet, first off, I don't want to go more than like a foot off the ground mm -hmm. because what if that goddamn thing breaks? You're upside I'm down. I'm gonna fall down on my head. Mm -hmm. Right. So they start pulling him and he keeps going up and up and up. Next thing you know, he's like, I don't know, what, six feet in the air? His head was at the head the I other guy's say, head level. I'd say eight. So yeah. but as he's getting pulled up, so again, you don't want to be upside down hog tied because if it breaks, you fall down on your head. Mm -hmm. He's being pulled up and his partner Billy runs and starts to grab him by the stomach and pull downwards. Right. Yes. I'm like, are you trying to kill this guy? 
Like, why would you do that? Maybe he's thinking he could lift Cactus up onto the pulley system. They lifted him up in the air and he just was hogtied for minutes on end. This is nuts. The part you are glossing over is that the only thing keeping Road Dog off the ground was a suspension apparatus applied by Terry Funk. <laughs> well, there is that as well. An insane man on his own. And Cactus holding the other end of the rope, by the way. But Terry Funk at least owns a ranch. I believe he can successfully hogtie. That's true. Now, if you'd have switched it and McFoley would be tying the guy up, then it'd be like, I don't know if this guy's got farming experience, I would, ranching experience. I see your point. I think if you had the not tying merit badge, Terry Funk would be more likely to get it than, mm -hmm. than McFoley. But Terry's insane, and I was watching him swing this cord around, his, hanging from the ceiling over his head, and he's kind of got it on Rody's feet, and he gets it on one, and you can almost see him like, eh, good enough, pull him up. This scared me a lot. You know what also scared me? It's going to seem like a weird analogy, but I put my baby on my shoulders, like in position if animal were on the top rope and we were going to or hawk and we were going to give her the doomsday device i see it's the easiest way I, to are you trying to coach it. whitney to do her part then she's sitting on my shoulders and i hold on to her legs but i always have to make sure that i hold on to her like shins because i'm afraid if i hold on to her shoes and she rolls back <laughs> yeah. she'll fall out of her shoes this makes sense right I got yeah. so i'm cousins. watching this, this fucking guy yes. hung upside down by his shoes yeah uh -huh. and i'm like what the fuck happens if this guy slips out of these goddamn boots he's dead Nobody gave a shit, apparently. This was nuts. Oh, they could tuck their head. It'll be all right. Oh, yeah. From eight feet up. That's a great idea. Maybe just land on his hands and do a handstand. Sure. The fucking road dog. Gymnast extraordinaire. He rode kill after that. Oh, great. Sorry. Luna called Sable an ignorant slut. Promised to give her another makeover tonight, but only when Dude. she was ready. Attitude era. Can you believe that made TV? It was on Saturday Night Live in the 70s. Granted, midnight-ish, but... So Vincent Mann came out for a promo. This was so amazing. I'll let you recap it, but I just want to say that when I watched this, number one, it was great because Vince McMahon is just so great. He's just so great. But you know who else was great was Kevin Kelly. Amen. Kevin Kelly, his job was to ask Vince the tough questions and not let him get away without answering. You watch this goddamn show today, and you have these robots that throw a generic question that's usually a stupid question, and then the other person just talks. It's like, why are they even there? What angers me the most about this is, how can you watch this and not realize that this is better than what they do today? Like, how? I don't know. It's a fake sport where you can script a segment like this where the interview person asks the tough questions, the heel tries to get out of it, the interview person keeps pushing him, and you get a great interview out of it. But instead, the guy that was part of this runs the company today, and his thing is, ah, just have some good-looking person ask a goddamn stupid question, and then the other person buries him and then talks about whatever. I don't get it. Now, the other thing that was great is, in the course of this interview... Kevin Kelly presses Vince McMahon. Last week, Steve Austin dared you to hit him. Why didn't you hit him? And Vince hems and haws and says, I do what I do for the WWE fans. Thank God he didn't say the universe. Now, Kevin Kelly does not let this go. He says, Vince, what do you mean? And Vince says, I do it for the WWE fans. I did not want to... I didn't want to... I didn't want to cause a problem with WrestleMania. Kevin Kelly's like, what are you talking about? And Vince McMahon hems and haws, and then he says, how could Steve Austin work WrestleMania with a broken jaw? And the fucking crowd laughs. Mm -hmm. I thought, this is so beautiful. Because... You haven't watched Raw yet, Vinny. I have not. This fucking thing at the end of the show with Stephanie McMahon and Hunter and Mick Foley. Mm. Stephanie McMahon's character has to be above all of the wrestlers. Yes. She's smarter than all of them. She's richer than all of them. She's superior to all of the performers in every single way. 
Vince McMahon's character, a heel foil that led to the greatest period in the company's history. Not financially, because they later went public, but the point is, the feud with Austin was like the pinnacle. It turned everything around. Vince McMahon was well below Steve Austin, but he believed, he believed that he could knock out Steve Austin. Or he was lying, it doesn't matter. But the fans knew this fucking guy thinks that he can knock out Steve Austin. It was preposterous. And Vince sold it like he was a big talker, but everybody knew that Steve Austin would kick his ass. It was so amazing to watch and so different than today. And it was so effective. Like the fans were begging for this fight to occur. They wanted this fight to happen because they wanted to see Steve Austin kick this guy's ass. Nowadays, it's all about you wrestlers suck and you're you're barely employable and without us you'd be in poverty how is this the same company with the same guy in charge i don't get it so vince said he did not appreciate steve austin's behavior as of late but he cannot blame austin for being upset after Shawn michaels had recruited mike tyson into dx and he had the question about why vince had not responded to austin's challenge to fight and Vince dodged the question for a while and then said yes, he did not want to ruin the main event by breaking Steve Austin's jaw. <laughs> it was so great because the way he said it, it was like, in his character's mind, well, of course he could knock out Steve Austin. Yes. Mm -hmm. But he didn't want to say that. He thought no. Kelly was stupid for not yeah. realizing he would have broken like, Austin's jaw. don't you all understand why I couldn't hit Steve Austin? I'd knock him out and break his jaw, yeah. you fucking idiots. That's what his character thinks. But you know he's out of his mind. Somewhere in there, he added that it would have looked bad if he had taken Austin down as well. Oh, yeah. So you can out-wrestle him and out-fight him. Mm. Yes. So the big question at the very end is, Kelly asks Vince, do you want Steve Austin to be WWF champion? And Vince smirks and says, it only matters what the fans think. And Kelly, a great reporter, did not let this man off the hook and ask the question again, trying to get a real answer, trying to nail, nail him down. And Vince said, well, it'd be one thing if Austin was reasonable and willing to be molded into a fitting champion. But as he is now, as champion, he would be a PR and corporate nightmare. And Kelly said, Vince, yes or no, do you want Steve Austin as champion? And Vince started to walk away. Kelly pulled him back to get an answer. Brave. <laughs> and finally, Vince says, it's not just a no, it's an oh, hell no. These fans were outraged. <laughs> they could not believe it. They're appalled. How dare you not want our guy to get over? I'm begging, I am begging everybody listening, listening to this right now. You must go back. It is the March 17, yes. 1998 edition of Raw. It is on the network. You have to go back and watch this interview with Vince McMahon and, Kelly, and Kevin Kelly. Number 251. Kelly. It's fucking unbelievable. It's unbelievable. You know, it just dawned on me. It was March 17th, and we didn't see a leprechaun. We didn't see a guy in green. No. How different from today's Raw. Yes, it was. Had a Steve Austin video package. It was not as great as the Sean one, but it was still awfully great. You missed something there, Vinny. I did. Pete Rose will be at WrestleMania 14. You were right. I did miss that. Craig is so into this Vince, or this, uh, what's his name? Pete Rose. Like, you were excited last week about this, and now you're excited this week about this. Like, you're the only guy. Who could possibly be excited about Ask Tom about Waller this? if he was excited that Pete Well, of Rose... course he was, but he was excited about Kane. Right. If Kane would have it tombstoned a... Jennifer Flowers, he would have been excited about Jennifer Flowers. It was Flowers. a big moment because a quote-unquote celebrity got tombstoned by Kane at WrestleMania. Yeah, but no one knew that here. It's true. So the video package talks about Austin loading freight in Texas, getting into wrestling, and being fired due to injury by WCW via FedEx. He showed him being the ringmaster. He went on, I don't know what talk show he was on, but he went on some ESPN or something and talked about how it was a sucky gimmick and he had to reinvent himself. Dude, if I were for WCW, I'd have been employed for 10 years because FedEx can't get anything to my house. <laughs> Just want to throw that in. Talk there. about beating a horse. <laughs> so, Dude. Showed him raising all sorts of hell over the past year and a half and talked about how in wrestling there's a lot of backstabbing and politics and bs Shawn michaels hurts his knee they make a music video for him i hurt my knee i get a kick in the ass let me tell that joke again steve austin should have lived here never would have got that fedex 
To be clear, the company execs thought Austin an Austin championship reign would be bad news for the promotion. You're going to write that down. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. From the figure four. Oh, yep. Damn it, every fucking time. God. Brian's job is hard. Dude, it is. <laughs> Triple H came out to pick a fight with Owen. He succeeded. No one was beating his ass despite the bad ankle. Yeah, this dumb shit, Owen Hart. God. <laughs> Somewhere in this here. Fucking idiot. Well, dumb shit, yes. Dumb shit, Owen Hart, yes, but also dumb shit, WWF, because they're having this brawl, and suddenly they say, well, I'm having this fight here. We'll go ahead and make it a title match, even though our champion is has a walking boot on. What the hell? Yeah. So, now it's a championship match, and the next thing you know, Hunter posts Owen... China runs out, hits Owen in the in the walking boot with a baseball bat. Hunter puts him in a toe hold, and Owen did not submit. But the ref stops the match and awards Hunter the title. What in the hell was the point of this? It's a good question. They're doing a match of Mania anyway. <laughs> That's a good Why, question. Let's do the title change there. And well, maybe they wanted a happy ending at WrestleMania. And By the way, Owen would win. This remember. went less than a minute, which brings the grand total of bell to bell ring action. Less than 12 minutes on a two-hour show. Yeah. With that Shawn Michaels video package and the Steve Austin or the Vince McMahon interview, I don't give a shit. They could add zero minutes of wrestling on this show. It'd be even better. Yeah. They would have got rid of the headbangers. Yeah. Would have been better. So, and the new Midnight Express <laughs> could have done without that. So Luna came out for a fight with Sable. And Geeks came now, out. Now, now, Brian. Yes. As you noted... Geeks came out to separate them, so the main event didn't happen. But you know what happened before that? They sent the ring announcer out there to introduce these women. They got full entrances with music. They had the truck play the song and the videos. Everyone was ready for this to be a fight, except when everyone stopped it from being a fight. What the hell was this? You know what was even better? Sable and Luna came out for this fight in high heels. Yes. <laughs> what? Did you see what Sable was wearing? Yeah! Is she going to wrestle in that at WrestleMania? In the actual mixed tag? Lord, I hope so. Very pretty lady. Yeah. It is like Miz and Maurice versus Cena and Nikki. 19 years earlier. Yeah, it's exactly like that. Kind of is. It kind of really is. It's a man and a woman against a man and a woman, Craig. <laughs> you got what me the there, hell Brian. else do you want? You got me there. So, everyone separated them. Until two they started, are married, two aren't. Until they started fighting and then they all backed off. So, uh, bunch of fake boobs. <laughs> Boy, howdy. Luna Goldust link yanks Luna out of the ring. Mero, I think, in the in his attempt to pull Sable off of Luna, threw her down. Yeah. All I know is suddenly Sable's selling her knee, and they're alone in the ring. Sable mm -hmm. and Mero are. Everyone else leaves. Sable can't even stand. Kane's pyro goes off, and he comes down to the ring, and he's, he hits the ring. Mero runs for his life. Screaming, I'll go get help. Great heel. So Kane's menacing Sable for a while and Bearer's laughing at her. And then Undertaker's dong goes off. The lights go out. I like Undertaker's dong hits. Mm. I tried to avoid goes off. Yeah. Well, I've been Sable, saying right? gong for a while and you corrected me every time. Well, so it is much... dong, but we don't have to talk about it goes off. Then you confuse oh. the listeners. Oh, that would oh. <laughs> Yeah, Kane was in the ring. All of a sudden, Undertaker's dong went off. They called it a bell on this show. So they call it Undertaker's bell. Actually, they were on Monday night on Raw. They kept calling it a gong. That's right. And I was just waiting, which one of you fuckers is going to say <laughs> dong? Because I know one of you is thinking about it. Nobody did. Regardless, Taker appears on top of the Titan Tron. He misquotes jewels from Pulp Fiction for a while. <laughs> Warns Kane that he will feel Taker's wrath. And then suddenly there was a coffin on stage. I don't know where this came from. Uh, yeah, what was up with that? I don't know. Just there. This thing opened up, and there was a gimp inside of it. Okay, so... It was! Got, the gimp from Pulp Fiction. That's right. It, yeah, and it got hit by lightning, and it burned up. Yeah. So, the Undertaker can teleport. Lightning can strike in a building with a roof, and you're worried about where the coffin came from? There was a gimp in the coffin, All of Brian. these are good questions. Like, what's the big deal? A gimp in the coffin? Big it was deal. a dummy. Where'd the, where'd the coffin come from? Did he teleport the coffin too? Yeah. Okay. I, see. I mean, hello. 
Ask a stupid That's question. That's what he does. So the cane in the box lit on fire, the gimp in the box lit on fire. Why do you keep calling him the gimp? Because it's a dummy. I, I can't get it out of my head now because he's it a gimp. It was a latex suit in the coffin. It was a dummy. It was a gimp. Vinny, it was a gimp, wasn't it? What is he talking about? Did it have a bad leg? Don't look it up, dum dum. You never saw Pulp Fiction, did you? No, hell no. Come on. Oh, jeez. What is the matter with you? It was a GNU image manipulation program. Is that what it was? I yes. looked it up, Craig. Yes, Brian, that's exactly what it was. Thank you. Let's play a song. Please. Ron number 252, March 23rd, 1998. The go home show for WrestleMania. And what a horrible show it was. I've seen way worse. Let's not kid ourselves this here. It's pretty bad, though. Yeah, but we got an actual I don't know main how event. You guys are able to do this night in, <laughs> night out, or week in and week out. This is terrible. Well, I watched so much bad wrestling that this was. It opened with a good Steve Austin segment. It closed with a good Steve Austin segment. In the middle, there was nothing good. Dude, we got a Rock Austin match with a finish in the main event. That's mm -hmm. true. Like that alone, this is better than ninety percent of these Raws we've been watching. So Austin comes out for a promo. Kelly asks him about uh, what Vince said when Vince openly admitted he did not want Austin to be champion. Austin said it didn't matter. He's going to walk through all the BS the WWF threw at him, and he wanted Shawn Michaels at Mania. He said DX is on the way to the building, and Austin promised to go to the back and drink a bunch of beer until they got there. So Sergeant Slaughter comes out and says, per Vince's orders, Austin's wrestling The Rock tonight. Austin says, maybe I'll just lay in a headlock for 30 minutes, and I laughed. And he said, or maybe I'll just knock his lights out like that. And he tried to play nice to Sarge and tried to share some beer. And then Sarge warned him that if you don't wrestle tonight, you will lose your Mania title shot. Now Austin's insulted. <laughs> he had tried to be friendly, and this dick turned him away. So, of course, Sarge got stunned. And as usual, Sergeant Slaughter takes stunners better than anybody. And that was that. I just, every time I watch this show, I just think of modern day Raw and Stephanie McMahon and how awesome it was back then where... All of these authority figures were such clowns. Like, Sergeant Slaughter's entire role is to be just a complete geek who gets stunned regularly. And Vince McMahon is the owner and he runs the show, but he's there to be a jackass. It's so different from today, and it's so much better. And the, and the bump that, uh, that um, Sergeant Slaughter takes on the stunner in the opening, uh, opening promo is... Uh, is it looked pretty good, but boy, he looked like a bumbling idiot. You're right. He was a bumbling idiot, but that was a great bump. Yeah, he tried to take like a... Uh, a uh, he did a flip bump. Yeah, he tried to take a flip bump, but he didn't get all the way over. <laughs> <laughs> That's what made it great. That was it, the one thing about Sarge is that guy can take a stunner. Unlike Vince. He takes it on the chin. And it's a hefty chin. <laughs> That's why it's so, so safe. Yeah. Absolutely. Chainsaw Charlie and Cactus Jack versus the Quebecers. The New Age Outlaws came out on stage and did stuff I don't understand at all. They were in formal wear. They set up a table and chairs. And they began to have a double date with blow-up dolls that were dressed like Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie. Blow-up dolls look surprised. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. As opposed to well, they... your normal blow-up doll, Craig? Craig just did an impression of a blow-up doll, everyone. So the mouth was wide open is what you were saying. Absolutely. Thank you, Craig. Hey, did you notice the sign in the crowd it said GIMP 669? <laughs> I told you! <laughs> yeah, there was. There was so, another really... Did Ryan actually looked that up on Google? Did uh, we look up GIMP? Did we explain no. that to him like, from last, last show? They sort of explained it to me. I didn't bother looking it up myself. Okay. That's good. Leave that safe search on, brother. I believe there was a giant masturbation sign on this show. Was I the only one that saw oh, that? Oh, I saw it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what the fuck was that? Yeah, I've been right. You did. There, there have been a lot of signs... In this era, of, well, it's the science in general in this era, but many of which are just not appropriate. That's usually like the nation of masturbation, which sounds like a really bad club to join. But this goddamn sign <laughs> well, was it's so not a club. big. It's one person. This was like they managed to bring in two signs. Right. And like the guy checking the signs, there's a giant sign that says master. Sure. And then he's got another sign that says Bation. Yeah. And the dude didn't put two and two together. He's like, oh, it must be. I guess Chris Masters wasn't there yet. He just couldn't figure out what this sign said when you put well, those two really together. Well, it's easy to explain it to an idiot that's working the ticket counter. Since we're discussing horrible signs, this is actually a couple of weeks ago when Hunter came out to do commentary, and there was a fa uh, fan behind the announce desk that had a sign that just read, Who Farted? And he mm -hmm. was pointing at the sign and pointing at Hunter and pointing at the sign and laughing right. his ass off like he was the funniest guy in the world. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's just a geek. 
And then, like, two minutes later, they pointed to another section of the arena, and the fan, fan there had a sign that read, I farted. Oh, good so for they, you. they were together, I guess. Yeah. And really quickly, talking about the, the commentary part of this, Jim Ross is trying to sell through this entire match the dumpster stipulation for WrestleMania, and I can never, ever <laughs> complain about a stipulation match ever again when you're trying to sell a dumpster match at WrestleMania. Hey, you say that now, but we're going to talk about Nitro, where they were they were promoting a bat match. Yes, for the first time ever. <laughs> a fucking bat match. So eventually, the Outlaws got bored with their blow-up dolls and went to the ring and attacked Jack and Charlie for the DQ. And they broke a table over Charlie's head, and they piled driver Jack on a chair, and that was the go-home segment for the dumpster match at Mania, and it sucked. You know, I gotta say, though, I was watching this, and I also could not figure out what in the hell the New Age Outlaws were doing. They're up there on the stage with their dolls, mouths agape, Craig. Yes. But it did suddenly hit me that it was so stupid, but you want to know what? It was different. And I watched this Nitro show, and it's the same show every single week for two years now. Mm -hmm. And even though the stuff on Raw isn't necessarily better, at least it's something new. At least it's not Bischoff and Hogan cutting another promo and having another horrible match with the NWO running in. I kind of got it. Jeff Jarrett versus Steve Blackman. And he said Jarrett would be in the tag team battle royal at Mania. They neglected to say anything about who his tag team partner might be in this tag team battle royal. By the way, just to note, they noted that Steve Blackman had not been pinned since coming into the WWF. Wow, he is undefeated. Well, not anymore. Because right. he tried to superplex, Tennessee Lee tripped him, Tennessee Lee held the foot down so Jarrett could get the pin. A second ref ran out to stooge him off, Jarrett dropped the ref, Blackman beat up Jarrett and he chased Lee to the back. You got all that? Listen, all I know is this show has so many horrible finishes. And granted, this was a screw job finish, but at least it was a pinfall there was finish. was a pin. And a ref comes in to dispute it. I was like, really? Yeah. They can't just let anyone win. There has to be 87 things going on at once. I did like Tennessee Lee running. He <laughs> ran up the ramp afterwards. Blackman to, chased him. It's hard to run in boots. <laughs> it's hard to run with a giant package. Excuse me? Like all the rumors about Tennessee Lee. I mean, it was patently obvious watching this guy run up the ramp. There's been a lot of dick talk He on ran show. like my baby. Because the big diaper. Sure. Oh, good. Yeah, not the big package. Really happy you clarified that. Yeah. And just really quick, when you're talking about the finish of the match, I just want to start just really quickly with the intro of the match. Who was the person doing this segment who said, you know what this entrance needs is a horse? I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself the entire time looking at this going, what? What what is with the horse? Did I miss something? <laughs> that's a good that's a good question. I hope as we get deeper into nineteen ninety eight at some point they will do a match where if Jeff Jarrett loses, the winner gets the horse and gets to turn it into glue. He has to fight for the life of his horse. No no it's So a you're fantasy booking the past. Yeah. Okay. No, it's a loser <laughs> leave good luck town. With that. It's a loser leave town where the guy has to actually ride out on the horse into the sunset. That works too. DX arrived with Mike Tyson in a limo. Loves that crotch chop, doesn't he? He's a big fan of the crotch chop. <laughs> <laughs> you mean that, that X thing he does with his hands? Yes, yeah. yes. As they call it. Undertaker did a promo from quote unquote his parents' gravesites. Oh, this is bad. Now listen, there's been a billion hokey Undertaker segments. Was this not the hokiest and worst of them all? See, the reason you say that, Vinny, is because you don't watch SmackDown. Has last the Bray week, Wyatt stuff been worse? Last week, Bray Wyatt, whose house had been burned down, he went back to the burned down house. He reached into Sister Abigail's grave. She had been burned to a crisp, and so he took her ashes and wiped them all over his own body as he cut a spooky promo. So, no, this was not the craziest thing I've ever seen. I didn't say crazy. I said hokey. <laughs> it was not First the hokiest of all, either. There's a guy and two tombstones, and it is immediately obvious, <laughs> plainly obvious, these people are all inside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this yeah, cemetery yeah. is indoors. You can see the roof. Yes. Oh, maybe it was a morgue. This is an Ed Wood skit with Undertaker. There was trees in the morgue, Brian. So, Taker cuts this promo about facing the devil in the form of his own flesh and blood, his brother Kane. He hopes they can all rest in peace as a family someday. He has to fight Kane, but he loved them. This sucked. <laughs> wow. I realized people liked it at the time. And people liked it. All this horrible Undertaker stuff for decades now. But I'm not going to tell you it didn't suck. It actually gets worse later on with Kane. Ah. Well then, oh, right now in fact, That's this right. was worse. Paul Bearer and Kane came out for a promo. 
Paul says he's sick of Undertaker crying about his dead parents. I am as well. He said Kane had the power, same power as the Undertaker did and asked for a demonstration. And Kane summoned a lightning bolt. And everyone booed because they knew it was dumb. So King has lightning hit the announce desk. And he has lightning hit a spotlight. And Jim Ross explains, these are unearthly powers. <laughs> well, he's right. <laughs> so Barrel rambles on, uh, Bear rambles on for a while. Says, Kane, show your powers one more time. Do what you want. And so Kane sees a guy randomly walking down the aisle. <laughs> just, <laughs> just happens to be there. And he shoots him with a lightning bolt. And the guy lights on fire. He runs up the ramp. And he's waving his arms around. And eventually he goes down. And they douse him with fire extinguishers. This is some of the stupidest bullshit I've ever seen. Hey, you know, I got to say something here. When they lit that guy on fire, it's funny because I wasn't even insulted that Kane used magic to light a guy on fire. I was insulted that after Kane lit a guy on fire, all of the folks with fire extinguishers yeah. mm -hmm. decided to wait until he was well done. <laughs> they weren't right there with a the fire extinguisher. No. They let the guy run in circles. Then they let him run up the ramp. Then they let him run in some more circles. Then they let him run, and finally when he fell down, they were like, now's our chance. Let's spray him with this fire extinguisher. And they put the guy out. It was hokey. I'm not going to lie. But I think the thing that annoyed me the most about it was, if you can shoot lightning and light guys on fire, why did Kane ever wrestle? I don't That's know. That's true. That's my big question. I'm hoping the media match is just them shooting lightning bolts at is, each other. Is there a clause in the wrestling handbook that says you can't use lightning? Well... I don't know what the, how strict the DQ rules are, right? But in theory, I think you could argue that a lightning bolt would be a foreign object. And Ryan, what do you think of this magic? You know, the only thing, like, there's two things that strike me about this is that strike, the first strike one, him. you know, you're, you're talking about how, um, you know, the range of things on this on this on this uh, television show that goes from then using using blow up dolls to uh, maybe domestic violence later on, and now they're setting people on fire, and the Undertaker is is talking to a dead parent. It's just like all over the place. Like, how the hell does any of this make television? But the thing with Kane that I kind of wonder, and, you know, it's something that was brought up just recently, you know, here is uh, 1998, and there is, like, assault with a deadly weapon. I mean, there is another prosecutable offense. There's not just Randy Orton setting sheds on fire in 2017. It started back in 1998. How the heck is Kane not arrested and, and, like, thrown in jail for this sort of thing? Dude, this is a long-ranging problem, and it's only going to get worse with Kane. Well, He's defiling graves, if I recall correctly. Grave more, robbing, as more I recall. Grave robbing. Yeah. There's further arson attempts. Well, the aftermath here, and frankly, the aftermath is the stupidest, is the stupidest part of it all. They took the guy's burned-up body, loaded him into an ambulance wished his family condolences, and moved on with the show. As if he was dead. <laughs> yeah, they offered condolences. Even if he's... Well, okay, yes. Yes, if, as if he's dead. But dead or alive, we just watched a man get burned up on live TV, and we're all just going to go, huh, and move on with our lives. Not only that, they... That's just, stupid. They hauled this guy off, and if you pretend it's real, Vince in the back going, God damn it, send out Skull and Eight Ball. Because that's the next two guys we see coming down the fucking ramp. Skull and Eight Ball. You know, a few years ago, this was uh, probably around the Metallica's Reload album. On their stage show, they actually had a stunt where the stage lighting rig would actually break apart and fall. And this series of events happened. It ended with a guy on fire that dove off the stage. And numerous 911 calls from arenas all over the world with concerned people that something had gone awry at a Metallica show. Nobody did that with the WWE. <laughs> No, everyone knew this was fake. Trump might have. Okay. <laughs> did you hear that story? Oh, you, you went there. <laughs> Triple H did an interview, and he said that when they shot the angle where Vince McMahon was blown up in a limousine, oh, geez. Donald Trump called to make sure that Vince was okay. What a mark. <laughs> Vince is about to leave. <laughs> 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 then he's not a fan of our president. <laughs> he's turning red right now. All right, let's go to Skull and Eight Ball, Vinny. Who cares? <laughs> the Midnight Express. I'm too depressed now. <laughs> hey, three minutes, 32 seconds. 
bunch of bunch of geeks Stolen came Eight Ball down. came out to wrestle the New Minute Express. Michael Cole explained the New Minute Express gimmick. All right. Oh, good. You ready for this one, everybody? He explains they're a new version of the old Midnight Express. Really? He has said this. Mystery solved. <laughs> I mean, perhaps he knew Donald Trump was watching. Had to explain it to this fucking. <laughs> See what you did. So, <laughs> Headbangers come out. Rockwell Express come I'm out. I'm very six. Please. Sniper and Recon come out. Savio and Miguel come out. The Quebecers come out. Jose and Jesus come out. Eventually, a fight breaks out. Everyone's just brawls with each other. We are now up to the show. Uh, two DQs and a pinfall due to manager interference. This was to set up a hey, the, tag team battle royal at the, WrestleMania. The best part of this is uh, everybody is in the ring beating the crap out of each other, and JR is uh, telling us that uh, Steve Austin's coming up next, so stay tuned as everybody is uh, kicking the crap out of each other in the ring because it didn't seem like JR even cared what was going on. I think JR knew everybody <laughs> was about to turn the channel. He called an audible. DX came out for a promo. Hunter showed himself beating Owen Hart for the year in PA title last week, so he's going to beat him again at Mania. Sean brought the camera over because there was a woman trying to get over the guardrail who had DX written on her massive cleavage. Might have been her bra size, by the way. <laughs> Sean. Sean appreciated this. He thanked her, then called her a skank in front of the whole world. Yeah, I want to mention that when Vinny says she was trying to get over the guardrail, that is not an exaggeration. There were grown men holding her back yeah. from jumping over the guardrail and attempting to rape DX. That's basically true. Did you notice the security guard holding her back? That had to be the world's worst job. He did not look impressed. <laughs> he was... Uh, she was passionate. Hey, get what you sign up for. Passionate woman. So, after calling attention to her and then insulting her on national TV, Sean runs down Vince and Austin for a while. This promo was heavily edited and not very well. If you watch at one point, Sean is standing three feet from Mike Tyson, and then he's standing basically arm in arm with Mike Tyson. So he says Austin has been bitching about working eight years to get here, while Sean himself has been doing this for 13 years, and they're the same age. He asks Tyson what's going to happen if Austin sticks his note or gets out of line, and Austin promises, I'm going to knock him out, heartbreak. <laughs> Who's going to be champion after Mania, Mike? You are, heartbreak. I love Mike Tyson. <laughs> he's amazing. He's just... It's like you couldn't create this I character. was just going to say. You it's can, impossible. No. You, you cannot create a character like Mike Tyson. And the best part of this entire thing is watching Mike Tyson, you know, be the baddest man on the planet. And if you, if you pan down, he's wearing white, white, white tennis shoes. And I'm going, that's a badass right there. He had white tennis shoes. He had his t-shirt tucked into his jeans, which were hiked up really high. And he just kept flashing that Degeneration X shirt. He was so proud. Mike Tyson is so proud to be a member of DX. Yeah. A grown man. In <laughs> hindsight, when you look at how much fun he was having, it's stunning he didn't stick around as a permanent part of the show. He came back. Here and there. Yeah, yeah. But it seemed like, like I say, as much fun as he was having, you'd think he'd want a full-time role somehow. You know what's amazing? I just want to mention this. Some of you probably remember this. Some of you may not. In fact, probably most of you have already forgotten. This whole thing, like all everybody wanted, all everybody wanted was for Mike Tyson to have a wrestling match at WrestleMania. And they couldn't get it done, obviously, and so he ended up being the outside enforcer. But imagine how big it would have been if they would have done Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Mike Tyson in the main event of WrestleMania. Couldn't get it done. Then about 10 years later, Mike Tyson shows up on Raw as a guest host. Mm -hmm. They fucking sign him to a match. They didn't even build it up a week in advance. They said, in hour two, Mike Tyson's going to be in the ring. The fucking guy got in the ring and did a match. Well, he punched Chris Jericho. He, he was in a match. Fair enough. Can you imagine? Most people don't even remember that. I, I have forgotten. Yeah, that's ridiculous. They announced that Rock could lose the Intercontinental title via disqualification in his Mania match against Ken, Ken Shamrock. Farouk versus Chains. Farouk orders the nation to the back. A minute later, Rock comes out by himself with a chair. And then Rock hits Farouk with a chair for the third DQ of the night. Now, a couple things. Uh, the finish was done. Rock, uh, Farouk had Chains in a front face lock. So there was no need for Rock to hit the ring here. And he clearly intentionally hit uh, Farouk with a chair. On replay, he even did the eyebrow right before doing it. 
So in storyline, it was his goal, but then he threw on a show saying, oh, darn, I was swinging for chains and missed. Two, he absolutely waylaid Farouk with his chair. Dude, this guy with chairs. Now, why? <laughs> Just a disaster. Why did no one say, hey, Dwayne, let's not do the chair shot anymore. Our roster is limited and shrinking by the week because of you. Well, you know. So you know, one of the things that struck struck me with this is, is that I, the, just really quickly the heat that the Rock gets from just walking down the ringside, and I'm thinking to myself in the product in 2017, those people viscerally hated the Rock, and I'm wanting to see that reaction now. And I'm going, you have no character on television these days that can produce that sort of emotion from the crowd, and I just I found it was struck, struck by it watching how people just hated the guy and you could never see that on television these days well we almost do roman reigns <laughs> he's the top baby face <laughs> yeah had a bradshaw video package which i only mentioned because it included what had to be the only tiger suplex of bradshaw's career and we had bradshaw versus barry windham the oh my god you didn't like this no <laughs> Fun while <laughs> there are so many horrible matches on this show until the main event. I tried to tell you. So the Rock and Roll Express come out, and of course they broke up with Wyndham and, well, especially with Cornette last week. Somewhere in here, they very casually announce their condolences to Hunter Brown, the man who was lit on fire before our very eyes about 20 minutes ago. So they wrestled a bit. The Rock and Roll Express distracted Cornette and Wyndham. Bradshaw won with a roll up. The new Midnight Express come out. They triple team Bradshaw. Then they leave. Then the Rock and Rolls make sure Bradshaw's alive. Yep. Rock and Roll Express came out wearing WWF t-shirts because they have actually quit the NWA. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. so, you were literally the only person who noticed or brought that up because the announcer said nothing. Yeah. And I didn't notice either. What about the gigantic mullet? Which I one? I was going to say whose. <laughs> <laughs> How is that news? <laughs> A lot of them. <laughs> I just was struck by that 98 going, mullets are still a thing. Oh, no, they weren't. <laughs> they were not a mullet in '98. Well, there were there were a few. They they, they were they were an endangered species in '98, mm -hmm. but they still did exist. They were. Hey, that's a good whale scout tie-in. They were endangered, but so you see, whales have mullets. Uh, Ricky Morton to this day still has that exact oh, same haircut. <laughs> of course. Yeah. The mullet's hard to find. You have to go to some of the uh, coastal cities to actually find one. But still uh, around. They're around. There's actually a football coach, a big time college football coach. Oh yeah. Who just who grew one. It's not like he's had one for 20 years. He had short hair and said, I want to grow a mullet. And he did. Dude, the mullet's going to come back. I hope not. Things do. Because because the mullet is not like a universally terrible haircut. Like some people can successfully wear a mullet. Sean Rick Michaels. Rude. Joe Sean Elliott. Michaels, kind of. Well, the Shawn Michaels of 95, not yeah. so much 2017. There's some guys that can pull off. As long as some guys can pull off a mullet or girls, it'll always come back. Femme mullet is never okay. <laughs> You haven't watched enough of these 80s and WA shows. There were some. I don't want to see Charlotte with a mullet. No. <laughs> Maybe not Charlotte. Oh, uh, now I do. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't until now. <laughs> then we had a terrible segment. Mark Merrow and Sable come out. I along mean, with... Bailey kind of has. No, she doesn't. No, she doesn't. No. Dana Brooke? Did anyone have no. bangs? No. Because that's technically a mullet. No. All right, go on. My boy's out in the ring. The. Mark Merrow? In <laughs> ring. Vince Russo. On camera debut of one of the few human beings I hate more than Donald Trump, Vince Russo. <laughs> That's probably not even true, actually. But I hate, I hate him. So, uh, Vince, if you're, reading, if you're listening to the show, fuck you. Mm. Uh, so there's a WWF Magazine Award to be presented to Sable and Sonny. So Mark Merrow comes out with Sable. And he says, Sable, you've been writing my coattails for years, but I have to admit, this is your moment. You deserve the spotlight. And he left. So they, then they said Sonny was sick and not there, but they promised she would be at Mania. So buy the show to see Sonny do something. So the, the deal was... Yeah, back then, that was a selling point. Sable and Sonny had been in bikinis on the magazine cover and had sold well. Yeah. Here is the Can exact... you imagine that Sonny and Sable in skimpy swimsuits sold more copies than when Sid was on the fucking cover of the magazine? Let me write that down. Yeah. So here is the exact text of the award on the plaque <laughs> that was delivered to Sable. WWF Raw Magazine, in appreciation of Sable for making the January issue of the Raw Magazine the greatest selling issue ever. Maybe Trump did write that. <laughs> Maybe Russo wrote it. Yeah. So Sable's being here acceptance speech when Luna Vachon and Goldust hit the ring. 
And in the melee, Russo just takes the plaque and hands it to Luna. Like, it, <laughs> it, it, there's no way you can watch this and not think he was in on it. He's supposed to be a neutral character. Luna takes the plaque and fucking drills poor Sable in the head with oh, it. Oh my god. God, she waffled. Non trained, non. And she's athletic. But well, it's hard to tell where the woman's skull starts with all that hair and hairspray. She drilled a sable. Sable. I don't goes think down. she broke the plaque on her hair. Well, plaque yeah. broken with a million pieces. That's a pieces. lot of Aquanet. And as Vince is there leaning next to him, uh, uh, Luna is sure to rip Sable's dress as well. So as Sable, who no doubt probably legit has a concussion, is clearly in a lot of pain. As they're leading her out of the ring, the crowd is whistling because they get to see a little leg as well. Yeah. I repeat, if you're listening, fuck you, Vince Russo. Hey, watch it again. Sable falls down, her dress is up, her ass is hanging out, and Vince Russo's job is to take off his jacket and cover her up. He's a chivalrous man. I was, yeah, I wish to surprise watching this because remember when uh, Vince a couple weeks ago wore that huge jacket that uh, got torn off of him? I was ex half expecting uh, the evening gown to come off of Sable at some point just because it looked at it went just looked so far out of place but God getting hit in the head like that just just looked horrible so yeah I mean I guess that she didn't uh, break it on just because of hairspray over her head so she's laying there Russo goes to take his jacket off and he's just staring at Sable and he's I gotta get this one arm out and now I gotta get the other arm out easy brain and now I gotta Shake it out a little bit, and now I'll lay it over her. It's like, you fucker, just put the goddamn jacket over her. You creep. He was probably trying... Tempted, very, very badly tempted to just finger her right there. Oh, wow. Vinny, please! Oh, jeez. Oh, it's a PG <laughs> show, bro. in a terrible mood tonight. I started it, but I didn't mean to for once. Rock versus Steve Austin in the main event. Hey, this was a good match. Yeah, Ten very... full minutes with a finish. Breaking news, everyone. Rock and Steve Austin had good chemistry together. <laughs> you imagine? That's my expert analysis opinion. Foreshadowing to next year's WrestleMania. <laughs> and the mania after that, and many down the road. That's true. So, they said, we now have news. Farouk is doubtful for mania. Yeah, because you keep hitting people in the head with solid objects on the show. Stop it. All the other nation dudes are out there with Rock. Austin had no fear and, in fact, went right after them. Because he's Steve goddamn Austin. He's great. Had a very fun main event. Austin won with a stunner more or less out of nowhere. It was the first clean finish on the show. In weeks. Probably, actually, yeah. <laughs> May have been years. D'Lo goes after him with a chair. Austin fights him off. And then DX comes out for a promo. Michaels promises to knock Austin out for the last time on Sunday. He teases hitting the ring, but Hunter holds him back. And that is how the Mania Go Home Show ended. That's the Mania Go Home Show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just DX comes out, and they stand on the ramp, all next to each other, and they look at the ring. And I was like, man, sign me up for that one, baby. It's the last we'll see of Sean for a long time. It's very yes. sad. Yeah. In the ring for many years. Or his wrestling. Ryan, have you been watching these shows regularly, or was this your first time going back and reliving some of this excitement? You know, in majority of cases, I'm listening to you guys do the reviews. I, I have, in the last couple of months, uh, tried to follow along as best as I can. And, uh, yeah, as far as um, uh, a Mania and Go Home show, this was uh, about as underwhelming of a, of a Go Home show I'd seen in many many years it was uh it's pretty disappointing as far as the end result went. hey wait till next monday now were you a fan did you watch this all live back in the day yeah yeah pretty big fan probably from uh 97 till 2000 2003 2004 and i probably lapsed for the most part um pretty much after that um I, I, I came across your site a few years ago, as I said, and uh, it's got me back into watching wrestling when you guys actually say, go watch this. Other than that, it's... it's I'll try to avoid um, saying that. Though. No, I try to... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so... But I, I did watch it, and, um, you know, going back and watching it, man, it sure doesn't hold its uh, its luster, especially after all this no. time. Uh, the product sure wasn't very good back then. They were really, really trying to lose the Monday Night Wars. They did, both were. They did on this night, for sure. Did you fall out of watching wrestling around your high school years by chance? Um, it was, uh, so I'm in my late 30s, so uh, I'm actually right around Brian's age. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I was probably just after high school when I 
I'm not going to let that slide. <laughs> Brian's much older than you. <laughs> Craig, Craig won't even let you continue. So he lets the world know that I'm actually 41. But Almost 42. But he's lying. Ah, give me a break. Whatever. Vinny. Shut up. So was it Steve Austin? Yeah, like, uh, what, what, what ran you off? This is a very important question for me. What, what ran me off? The, pro the product ran me off. The PG, um, the, the, the PG era probably ran me off. I thought I was, uh, I enjoyed the more edgy product. I enjoyed the more, I guess you could call it reality-based product. And because uh, I, I think these days they're confused on their audience. They, they think that they're, you know, uh, their demographic is kids and younger children where, you know, their majority of their audience is, you know, over Us. the age of 30 or 35. So. Their audience is the four of us right now, actually. <laughs> Seriously, that's like their main audience. All right, let's do Nitro. Here we go. Monday Night Raw, episode 253, March 30th, 1998. As Brian noted, the night after the era of Steve Austin officially began, the night after WrestleMania in 1998. This was the beginning of a new era, but you know what? This was the night that they got rid of the winged eagle. It was. God Damn it. And it must have made you... Do you cr sadness or anger? When Vince McMahon came out with the new belt, I was like, oh my god. <laughs> Seriously? Like, and this yet, is the end? And yet there's still wings on the new belt. Well, I will say, I'm a big fan of the Winged Eagle, but the belt they replaced it with was not a disaster. Oh no. There's a big eagle on it. It's big, and it's gold. It looks like a mix of the Winged Eagle and the big gold belt. Sure. Rick Flair has. So at the time, when I when I saw it, I didn't hate it. I mm -hmm. was like, that's a pretty goddamn cool belt right yeah. there. But later, when they got a bunch of really shitty belts, yes. then I started to think, man, can they just bring back that Winged Eagle again? Plus, it was on navy Wait. leather, which I thought that looked really cool. Yes. Was Stone Cold the first one with a custom belt? At yes. some point coming up in the next few years? At some point. Or is that not until the rack? At some point in the next month or so, he debuts the Smoking Skull belt. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, the show opened literally with triumphant fanfare recapping WrestleMania. I assume this was edited in, but it was glorious. And it even hit a, a, a fantastic flourish right at the very end with Austin raising the belt over his head. It was great. So, the crowd's chanting for Austin, but out comes Vince instead, and he has, as noted, the big new giant WWF championship belt over his shoulder. Vince has some mic troubles, but eventually he introduces Steve Austin with as much enthusiasm and joy as he can muster. And Austin comes out, and he's got the winged eagle, and he's looking at the belt over his shoulder, looking at Vince's belt, looking at his old belt, looking at Vince's belt, hits the ring, tosses the winged eagle down like into a mud puddle and yanks the new belt out of Vince, off no, of Vince's no, shoulder. No, no, no. He threw it down on Vince's foot. Even better. And Vince yeah. grabs his foot and starts hopping on one leg. Aha, yeah. I see. Sold it. Yes. And Austin enthusiastically grabs the new belt and he's very happy to have this one now. So Vince is putting on a brave face and he's, and he's trying to uh, be friendly. He offers Austin congr congr congratulations. Easy for me to say. He wants to clear up some misunderstandings he had said about Austin's title reign a few weeks ago. He's proud of Austin becoming champion and proud he's representing this company. My company, he stresses. And he says, with my vision and mental prowess and your charisma and physical prowess, you could be the greatest WWF champion of all time. And he was right. You know, it is funny. I didn't mention this when they actually did that interview with Austin and Vince where Vince flat out said he did not want Steve Austin to be the champion. Mm-hmm. Because in storyline, Vince wants a company guy. He wants a guy who's going to represent his championship that he can control. That's a great storyline and all, but Austin was a challenger. The champion was Shawn Michaels. That's yes. true. The ultimate degenerate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, that doesn't make any sense. I think, they had a, I think they had Bret Hart in mind for that role, and things just didn't work out. Vince was screwed one way or the other. Really, yeah, all three guys had a problem with him. So, Austin cuts to the BS, says, I know you hate me, I hate you too. And v Vince tries to uh, play nice again, and he says, come on, you're a swell guy and I love you. And Austin says, what? And he makes him repeat that part over and over again, and finally Vince says into the mic that he loves him. Austin cackles, says he loves Vince too. So he's going to keep doing whatever he wants, not even Vince can tell him what to do. And then Vince drops the bombshell, where he says, Steve, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And Austin asks for an explanation. Vince says, the easy way is that you adapt. And the hard way is you'll be forced to do what I want anyway. So Austin says, can I have 10 seconds to think about this? And Vince says, sure. And Austin scratches his chin, 
looks off into the distance deep in thought, and he decides to kick Vince in the gut and drop him with a stunner. Then he announces this is how he's going to do things the hard way. And uh, he leaves as everyone tends to Vince, and everyone, all the fans are cheering, everyone's happy. And ordinarily, I would say that it would be dumb to start this feud with a stunner, but A, Austin had already stunned Vince before anyway, so why not? B, uh, this is this feud needed a kickstart. <laughs> to make it abundantly clear what's going on. And so I was totally fine with starting the feud with an exclamation point. You know, all these Raws we watch with Stephanie McMahon eviscerating the talent, as soon as he stunned the guy, the announcers are like, he got him again! Because this is now, it's been multiple stunnings. Vince McMahon hasn't gotten one thing on Steve Austin. Steve Austin has humiliated him right and left. He made the poor guy as uncomfortable as possible in the ring. He stood up to the guy. He gave the guy the stunner. Like, Dave actually compared Vince to Stephanie. I don't even know what he was talking about. I remember that Vince was humiliated so regularly and so often that it actually made no sense that he didn't fire the guy or just strip him of the title. It was preposterous that he didn't do that, given how often Steve Austin humiliated Vince McMahon. Like two stunners, and I guess Vince arrested him today. But man, Vince is getting his next week. Yeah, how can you not cheer for a guy that uh, sticks it to his dick boss? Stanley, what do you think about this? Well, I just thought it was a great kickoff, as uh, Vinny pointed out. It's just classic. It just weighs the groundwork, and it's, it's just interesting to go back and look at it and see how it's just going to progress you know, over the next year or so. And I think it was great. I think Vince is as good as it gets as a character, and the post-stunner was classic. I, I think him being tended to in the back and being walked out was awesome. How long have you been watching wrestling, by the way? I uh, actually looked that up today because I figured that would come up. So it's probably my earliest memories, and it would be the lead-up to WrestleMania two. so 85, early 86. Mm. We predates us. We're all in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I said, first, first, some of my first memories are going to the uh, Rosemont Horizon here, seeing some of the guys when I was mm, six or seven. Did you go to Mania two in Chicago? I did not, but That's I did see some of the pre-loop with the Bulldogs and the Hart Foundation matches before, and the uh, Hart Foundation would always find a way to win somehow, and then when I watched it on, I believe a VHS, like a week after, I was so excited when the Bulldogs won, so uh, yeah, good memories. Literally every guest host we have is exactly like us. It's crazy. Scary. By that you mean awesome. Well, of course. Yes, of course. Vinny, can I, uh, can I take this real quick? I... So the next match, we have uh, oh. Los Bariquas against the LOD 2000. Now let me, uh, let me do a little history for you. A long three weeks ago, the Road Warriors fought each other for the first time. They were going to break up three weeks ago. Apparently, they came back at WrestleMania and participated in the uh, Tag Team Battle Royal. They won it. Wow. Do you ever remember? Those two outfits were something. I, I was a fan of LOD from a kid, and I blocked out those outfits, especially those full masks. I just made no sense to me. So, in those three weeks, did we ever get a hawk versus animal? No, of course not. Don't be so, crazy, Craig. Okay, so that whole breakup led to Sonny sweet talking the it's one word for it. Okay, the Road Warriors into becoming a tag team again, mm -hmm. changing their look, mm -hmm. and and having Sonny as their manager. Yes. Yeah. Three weeks. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, clearly Sonny saw something in them, and she said, Some "Listen, untapped potential. You guys can fight or get together. We'll give you a makeover, and I'll be your woman." I will say this: if she came <laughs> they out were like okay, I will done. say this: if she came out wearing vinyl. I probably would have been in. Dude, whatever she came out wearing was fine with if, me. She can, yeah. If she wants to wear a thong with a fringe skirt over it, that's cool. That was awesome. Yeah. Now, the match, they spent all this time making over Legion of Doom. They gave them, they buzzed their heads. They gave oh, them they new gear. Hair. They came out, and then it's just a match with the Bariquas. <laughs> I was like, 
Okay. And not even the good ones. It's just as terrible as ever. At least it was quick. There was a couple. Okay, one. This squash I labeled it a Crockett-style squash in my notes. It was that quick. It was That's what it was. It was. They squashed it, them in a minute, one with a doomsday device, and Sonny introduced them. Apparently, it's the first time they were named as LOD 2000. Yeah, great. Kevin Kelly was backstage. He announced that Vince had called the police and demanded that Steve Austin be arrested. He had a really cool commercial with legends like Freddie Blassie and Killer Kowalski and Ernie Ladd and Gorilla Monsoon. They're all talking about the good old days, and as much as they love that time, they, they know that today's stars are even better. This is classy and cool. <laughs> right after a Bariquas match. And then we have Kevin Kelly again, who announces that the Disciples of Apocalypse had smartened up Austin. That's what he said. Warned him the cops were coming. <laughs> <laughs> they would know. Let's talk about that again. The Disciples of Apocalypse, the skinhead motorcycle gang... Alerted Steve Austin, you got to watch out with them cops. Well, they all have police scanners. They know they're coming. So Austin claims that Vince did not have the balls to have him arrested. That's that. Mm -hmm. Kurgan versus Chains. This was no good. Yeah, this. let's talk about that video again about how things are so much better now <laughs> than they were back in the days of <laughs> Freddie Blassie. I don't think Kurgan or Chains made that video. Good God. The, the, Horrible the, the, theme of, the theme of this episode of Raw was tremendous promos and angles and absolutely terrible wrestling. Right. So, I actually wrote this Michael uh, Cole quote down. He said, there's the quickness now from Chains. <laughs> he, at no point he showed any quickness in this match. Well, you know, compared to Kurgan. Kurgan may have actually been a tree. Yeah. I'm not sure. I was trying to discern sure. if he was worse than Kali. I think he was. Let's waste no time on this. Kurgan won with a claw hold. Jackal insisted this was the announcer's fault. Kurgan dragged the chains away by the face. Vince greeted the cops backstage. They went to break. After the break, he led them through the building, told them to take the first door on the right, and they went down the hallway. And after years, decades really, of watching Steve Austin and Vince McMahon segments, I was sure these cops were going to be locked in a broom closet or something. Jeff Jarrett versus Agala. Agala made his comeback, missed. Hold on a second. Yeah. Jeff Jarrett versus Aguila? I don't know. What yeah. the fuck was this? He's 19, bro. Has there ever been a bigger Styles Clash in the history of wrestling? Style Clash? Later on the show, actually, I think there was one. I was thinking of AJ versus Shane McMahon, actually. That's all well, that's maybe a bigger weekend. Styles well. Clash. This fucking match was horrible. You got, a, you got a luchador who can't even work American style, and all he knows how to do is fly, and Jeff Jarrett just... Beats his ass and squashes him yeah. on the ground. That's what, he wanted. That's what they wanted to happen. <laughs> Good God. Jarrett won with the figure four. Steve Blackman ran out, attacked Jarrett, and Jarrett and Tennessee Lee ran for their lives at the first opportunity. Like there was no enhancement talent in this town. <laughs> yeah, they, there, there was. His name was Augula. Destroyed the, uh, once again, the light heavyweight division was slaughtered on this show. Oh, Dude, yeah. it's, it's, it, gets, it gets worse. Yep. So backstage, cops are leading a handcuffed Austin out of the building. Austin breaks free, charges Vince, and slams into a locker. <laughs> Even when he's getting arrested, yes. he's still humiliated Vince. And they cops, cops wrangled him and dragged him away. And they replayed the whole thing after the break and showed Austin being placed in the squad car and driven out of town. Then Vince, Slaughter, and Briscoe came down to the ring. Vince said that the fans deserved an explanation and perhaps Mr. Austin needed a 24-hour cooling-off period. But Austin had made his choice, and so Vince had made his. Man, it's Montreal all over again, baby. Triple H got a short backstage promo vowing, to, vowing a new era of the WWF tonight, that's for sure. Nation of Domination got a promo backstage. Now, we talked about the new sort of winged eagle belt for the World Championship. I believe this is also the debut of that shitty Intercontinental title that lasted for like oh, a decade and a half. that ugly ass that thing. Short, uh, short you know what it squat looks like? belt. You know what it looks like? It looks like when you take a penny and you run it through the machine that like stretches it out and <laughs> puts a true, design actually, on yes. it. That's what it is. It's terrible. And Rock said he guaranteed the nation would be the strongest it's ever been after tonight. He turned to Farouk. And said Farouk had opened Rock's eyes, something he should have seen a long time ago, and for that he was grateful. And then he vowed that after tonight, the nation would be stronger than ever. Foreshadowing. There was hidden, hidden, hidden messages here. So we got Farouk and Rock versus Ken Shamrock and Steve Blackman. 
Rock's selling. You see, <laughs> the Mania match had ended with Rock trapped in the ankle lock, and Shamrock would not let go. So Shamrock was disqualified, mm -hmm. but Rock's ankle was hurt. He limped throughout this entire segment like the mummy. Yep. It was tremendous. He teased wanting to start, but then immediately tagged in Farouk. So Farouk went the whole way, had some success, but more failure. And finally, he had a spine buster and dragged himself to the corner. And Rock said, if you're going to tag me, you must stand on your feet and tag me. He held his hand up high. And then when Farouk failed to do that, Rock gave up and walked out on him. And they very quickly pinned Farouk with a belly to belly. Yeah, they missed the pinfall as Rock is walking backstage. How do you miss the pinfall in a wrestling match? Well, to be fair, The Rock was far more entertaining. I would have filmed him as well. So, uh, Farouk calls Rocky out. So, Farouk can deliver an ass whooping. Rocky limps back out. He gets in Farouk's face. They have a brawl. The nation and the officials separate it. And Rock leaves by himself, but Farouk calls him back again. And this time, Rock responds with a raised eyebrow, which was caught on the Titans run. And that was the cue for the nation to take out Farouk. They destroyed him. Rock returned, made it four and one, laid Farouk out with a rock bottom, declared himself the ruler and leader of the nation. Then he hit one more stomp and added, quote, take that back to Haiti where you came from. Yeah, <laughs> Haiti. Yeah, that, that, that seemed odd. Dude's from Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like Haiti. Yeah, I guess. Same. It's same a place. Climate. It's a place. <laughs> same climate. What do you make of this, Stanley? What did you think of the nation of domination? Uh, well, I mean, it's 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 great seeing the Rock again. It, it's the building of all the characters we see for their boom period, and Rock gets better every week, a little bit in the ring. And I, I know you guys sometimes a month or two ago said eh, Rock had some work to do in the ring. Didn't see it tonight, but I you know I watched a little bit of WrestleMania yesterday, and uh, it's great. The, again, it, this 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 Raw is very weird because it's just so. It's almost crash TV to a point, but it just so builds up everything. Uh, there's so much stuff you see for the next, what, three or four years of, of their big period. So I'm, I'm enjoying it. And, you know, the next, uh, the next segment is one I remember the most, I think, from this show. Hey, let me, tell you, let me tell you something about this segment and the next segment. They both had something in common, and that was there's a leader who, in one case, was kicked out of the group. In the other case, he's out of the group because he's hurt, and they proceeded to elevate somebody else. Rock got elevated you... to the leader of that group, and Triple H got elevated to become the leader of DX, both on the same show the night after WrestleMania. It was so like fucking novel, I couldn't even Brian, believe it. It, it, it. Sorry, guys. In the, in the past, Brian's been pointing out that during the build-up to WrestleMania, the DX thing... Uh, you know, Hunter would have this goofy character the whole time, and when Sean needed to snap it in, he'd snap out of it. Why Hunter would keep the goofy uh, character going in the background, but in this one, he was all serious. So it was really interesting to see how it actually progressed. So, as noted, Triple H and China came out for a promo. Hunter claimed he had never trusted Mike Tyson, but every time he questioned Shawn Michaels about Tyson, Shawn had called him kid and told him not to worry, let me make the decisions. Hunter said Sean had dropped the ball, but he's picking it up and he's taking care of the decisions from now on. So as of tonight, he is forming a new DX army to take care of business. Take care of business that should have been taken care of from the start. When you start an army, you look to your buddies, you look to your friends, you look to the click. And he points to the stage and out comes six. Now I want to say before we get to six, X-Pac, who actually on this show was just referred to as Kid. The Kid, mm -hmm. yes. The Kid. Isn't it funny that Shawn Michaels' return match four years later was with Triple H? And they didn't even play up this storyline, but it made sense. Yeah. Hunter buried the guy because he fucked up with Mike Tyson. And they basically set the stage for them to feud when Shawn came back. Yeah. They didn't think he was going to retire and yeah. then be out four years. Right. But you know what? Jumped right back in. And they had the match they built up right here. That match was a masterpiece. That match was way. awesome. Yes. Dude, sure. I was so scared. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we so, all were. Oh, my God. I thought his back's going to break and he's going to die. We watched it together, right? Yeah, I think so. They yeah. did such a good job convincing you this man should never be in a ring. He's like old and broken down. He's decrepit. Turned out he was great. 
Triple H got the what heat. What a work. Triple H got the heat. With a backbreaker. With a backbreaker. That's right. I, I do remember, remember all of this. Amazing. I we think got... I copied that match with you. What? How'd that go? We copied that as a fucking hair match. Ooh. Oh, I oh. know. Hmm. Yeah, with, with which one, Vinny or Craig? It was Vinny. Vinny. Me and Vinny had a hair yeah. match. Yeah, I'm I, so happy he didn't know. I copied <laughs> many... Uh, the, the less known about that match, the better. Yeah, I tried. I still say... I did. I bad. tried. You tried, too. It was not meant to be. No. <laughs> so it, was, it was a message from the gods. Quit fucking copying these matches, you That's jackass. True. So, although Sean Waltman had not been seen on Nitro in months, his buddies had been wearing the sixth shirt forever. So as far as most people knew, unless they had happened to see the Thunder before this... Uh, they thought he, they probably all thought he was still employed on Nitro. Mm -hmm. So he comes out, has a big hug with uh, Hunter, and he politely greets China. And it was very awkward watching all of this 20 years later. Things, I thought, I thought yeah, things the same got thing. weird. They did get weird. I, I think, I think the last said about this is probably the best forever. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I can't deny that I felt a twinge of uh, uncomfortableness. There wasn't a wink or a how you doing or anything like that. No, just very friendly. Yeah. So, well, it's just, at the time, it was his buddy's girl. That's true. <laughs> and his buddy was also mm -hmm. there. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, Walman doesn't address any of that. Uh, Hunter says, this man has been an indentured servant for two years. He's got a lot to say. Go get him, kid. I just like the way he tied that in with the way Sean had called him kid. So, Walman starts by sucking up to and firing up the crowd. Then he starts shooting, as uh, Jim Cornette would later say. He says, Hulk Hogan has said Waltman cannot cut the mustard. As we will later see, that's what Hogan had said on Nitro. But Hogan sucks, Waltman explains, and therefore has no business determining who cuts mustard anywhere. He says, Eric Bischoff has his head up Hogan's ass. So he's been sitting at home, he gets a call from his old friend Triple H saying DX needs his help, and he just ran to help his old buddy. And he adds that Scott Hall and Kevin Nash would be there too, but they are being held hostage by WCW. At this point, Jim Ross began to get very uncomfortable in commentary. Waltman says it's a new era of DX. They are here to rip ass on the World Wrestling Federation. That is a quote. <laughs> Ironic. And, uh, actually it is. Isn't it? <laughs> also foreshadowing. Oh, God. Please. So, you fucker. So, he finishes. Everyone cheers. It's a great babyface promo. And they cut to the biggest goof you ever saw doing cross chops in the front row. It may have been James Ellsworth's dad. <laughs> you know what's funny is, I always kind of go back and I mean, I wrote a book about all of this, the WCW side, and I go back and I kind of scan through the Observer before we do these shows from whatever date we're doing, but I mostly am watching the television, and I'm trying to watch the television as a fan. Like, as a fan, I watch this show, I kind of know what's going on at the time, I'm trying to sort of block a lot of it out of my mind, I'm trying to watch it from the perspective of a viewer. I love... Sean Waldman is a really, really nice guy. He's a great guy. Been on the show several times. Friendly fella. Very smart. But there is a belief that him jumping to WWF was like a big turning point in the war. Let me tell you something watching this as a fan. This guy hadn't even been on Nitro in months. Like, he showed up in the NWO. He was one of 15 guys. He walked around with a video camera. One day he was just gone. And like, I bet a lot of fans watching didn't even notice because there's like 85 guys in the NWO and they like randomly come and go. They replaced him with five. Nobody has any fucking idea what was going on backstage with Hall and Nash and Bischoff and the politics and x -Pot. All of, No one had any idea what was going on. And then one day the 123 kid comes back to Raw and he cuts a promo Referencing stuff from stuff from WCW, it was just really weird. Like, I mean, it was kind of cool, but it was also just weird. Like, it's not like Hall jumped, or Nash jumped, or Hogan jumped, or like one of the absolute tippy-top stars of WCW. He was a guy that was there, and then he was not there for a long time, and now he's here. Just very weird to watch it just from the perspective of watching the two shows. It's not nearly as groundbreaking as people make it out to be. Austin winning the title, that was groundbreaking. They showed Sable powerbombing Luna at WrestleMania. And then more history. The very first Val Venus vignette aired. So Val's in bed 
watching his own porn video. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. That is weird. I was really thinking about that. I mean, not too hard, but... I need to interview... Just halfway. ...a porn star and just ask, like, do you sit in your bed with the covers up and watching your own fucking movies? Like, what? He was... And you could kind of hear moaning. So right. it wasn't like he was watching, yeah. like, the soap opera part, this was or whatever a, you'd call it. It's a really weird inception. He was watching himself while being filmed. He was watching it the was. humping. Yeah. And who knows what was being done to the cameraman. Maybe he was examining his own technique. I guess. He How does this come across on television? I bet it did. Should I switch my angle? Oh, I have so many jokes right now. Am I working light enough? <laughs> <laughs> So, he claimed to have a gift no other male had ever been blessed with, and when he penetrated the WWF, ladies all across the country would be squealing with delight. And then we got a graphic that said, Val Venus is coming. Oh, okay. M. Yeah. And they go back to the arena. This was so fucking wacky. <laughs> It was it was long. I, I mean, too. Well, okay, no pun intended. Segment, but the like, yeah. It, yeah, the segment was. Thank you, Craig. It, it wasn't like a ten second thing. I mean, it, it maybe felt like two minutes, but it had to be over a minute. I mean, it was just like the the decor. The oh yeah, it, Sack it gives music. me the creeps. Yeah, and giggling at himself. They don't show the TV. You see the back of the TV and the back of the VHS recorder, Absolutely. the VCR. Yeah. I was like, that fucking thing's the size of a tank. You know what? If if he really would have showed up on a porn shoot and said, "Yeah, I'm here for the uh, audition," they would have thrown him out. It's just so strange. I mean, it was goofy back then. It's it was way goofier now. It was watching in 2017. It felt like someone made a spoof video for <laughs> YouTube or even a Vine or a Tout. Yeah. And somehow it made TV. You remember his entrance video? Oh, I do. Where he, <laughs> oh yeah, where he's wearing the purple helmet and he comes out of the bush. Yeah, I forgot yeah. about that. Detail. I believe Dennis Jameson's in that vignette when at some point that they take that clip from. But that that's nice? down the line. That's for future weeks for you guys to watch. I can't wait. The uh, Nintendo 64 game that came out about this time. You could actually mix and match entrance videos and entrance songs. And my friends put. Uh, they took Val Venus's entrance video and matched it up with Billy Gunn's I'm an Ass Man theme song, <laughs> which changes the whole thing, let me tell you. Hey, you know, speaking of, of uh, porn stars, because we were, so there's a porn star named, I'll just say, Courtney. Yes. And yes. she's got a radio show. I'm going to be on it on Saturday. Hmm. She's doing... It's a sports show, and I think I'm on it. Lance is on it. It's called Between Decletes. I get it. Uh -huh. Yeah, Between Decletes. So anyway, she contacted me to be on the show, and I said yes. And then she's been tweeting that I'm going to be a podcast. on yeah, yeah. the show. Yeah. Anyway, I've now been followed by like two dozen porn stars out of nowhere. Huh. They just randomly have followed me. So maybe I will DM, and I will ask the question. You sit under the covers and watch. I bet you don't videos of yourself and your performance to find out if it's acceptable. So this Val Venus thing airs, and they go back to the arena, and like a solid minute goes by before Jim Ross is able to speak. <laughs> he's just so ashamed of what he's a part of now. Talking, speaking of shame, talking about Noga versus Mark Merrill. So they all come out, and then Luna comes out. She demands a rematch with Sable. Sable immediately accepts, like a good baby face. Luna says she wants a special match. Sable says, any match you want anywhere. And Luna, to make a long story short, challenges her to the very first evening gown match. <laughs> this show is such a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. I thought Sable actually did a good job on this with her reactions and stuff. She did do a good job. So Mero is yeah. outraged. He refuses to let Sable accept. Luna threatens to strip Sable to her bra and panties if she's wearing them. This, of course, made the fans happy. Sable said she'd already kicked Luna's ass once. She'd be happy to do it again. Luna called Sla Sable a slut twice, and she left. Nothing like a match where you're rooting for the heel. That's exactly the point of this, yes. Now that I think about it, Luna and Val, same voice. Kind. <laughs> well, yeah. 
So as for the match here, Mark Mero absolutely destroyed Takamichi Noku and beat him with a low blow and a TKO. Why even bother having a light heavyweight division? Dude, that's not even it. They killed a guy, and then they have Dick Togo, Men's Teo, and Shoichi Funaki run in and beat up Taka to set up a feud in this division they just killed. Yeah. <laughs> what a yeah. fucking waste of time. The debut of Kai and Tai. Yes. And, the and right, right after Sable, too. I mean, the crowd's not going to give... No! Yeah. Two dams about this. Yeah. Her boobs are bigger than all three of them. <laughs> yeah, damn right. The, the nine guys who... <laughs> wow. The <laughs> nine guys who had Prodigy in this crowd were uh, chanting for the BWO and Kayantai. Headbangers versus New Midnight Express. Oh, my God. Yeah. I couldn't even believe the Headbangers were the champions. I'd totally forgotten. This was a championship match. The NWA World Tag Team Champions. And speaking of NWA champions, mm -hmm. Dan Severn brought out NWA World Heavyweight Champion Dan the Beast Severn. And he brought mustache. himself out? Cornette brought him out. That's what I meant. Yes. Dan Severn is so great. <laughs> He's so awesome. He's the only guy that can pull out a must pull off a mustache better than Rick Rude. I was gonna say him and Rude, or they should have had a thing going. It was like eighteen ninety eight, not nineteen ninety eight. <laughs> so Cornette well, says, Don, well, let's, uh, "Let's not forget Don Fry. He's got to be in that." Oh, that's okay. true. Of that's course, true. Okay. Yeah. maybe that oh. one. Yeah. So Cornette says, "Everyone's shooting tonight, so I went out and got a shooter." And he lists all of Severn's accomplishments, including a win over Shamrock. And Ross is sure to point out Shamrock had a win over Severn too. The match itself was a boring formulaic tag match, which made it simultaneously the worst Midnight Express match of all time and the best Headbangers match of all time. Hmm. So the ref gets distracted by Thrasher, which lets the new Midnight Express hit a rocket launcher on Mosh and pin him. Thank God. <laughs> Title change, baby. The new Midnight Express NWA champion. was the rocket launcher, not the boom shakalaka, by the way. That's how what I always call it. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Uh, Cornette whispers in Severn's ear. Severn hits the ring and destroys both headbangers by himself. The fans could see where this was going and immediately started chanting Shamrock's name. And all I could think was, imagine... My first thought was, imagine in 2017 if the WWE had a pair of UFC main eventers. And then they realized, wait a minute, they're halfway there. They just need Frank Mir. <laughs> you know, I do love that Cornette couldn't just say, hey, Severn, go kill those guys. He had to make it a secret. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Those, those were some great suplexes, too, and I don't think the headbangers helped very much. So. No, <laughs> he just tossed it. Was they're, probably, great. they're probably openly, yeah. openly resisting. Mm -hmm. Yes. But they're powerless before the might of Dan the Beast Severn. So Steve Austin was taken to jail and arrested. And as we all know from every TV show we've ever seen, every episode of Dragnet, you got one phone call. And as we also know, Steve Austin and Jim Ross are best friends. That's right. So it made sense that he called, he called Jim Ross. That's right. And he, from jail... He threatened to do all kinds of things to Vincent Mann next week. And Lawler correctly noted, those are terroristic threats. <laughs> he was not wrong. You should not do that on your one phone call from prison, everyone. Don't be like Steve Austin. You're not him. I do love that unlike these geeks today, Steve Austin's arrested, taken to jail. He is unrepentant. <laughs> I do not care if I'm taken to jail. I'm going to show up next week and kick your ass. He knows he's probably going to jail again. He don't care. They were setting up a cage for the main event when the lights went out. Kane and Paul Bearer appeared. He admitted The Undertaker had won the decision the night before, but things were not over between him and Kane. No one had ever kicked out of Undertaker's tombstone before, but Kane kicked out of two of them. He beat Taker all over the ring before getting pinned, and Bearer had gone to bed a proud man. Then he was awakened by a dream. A dream of a wrestling ring surrounded by fire. With Kane Watch standing all alone. Puerto Rican tapes. And <laughs> he challenged Undertaker to step into his dream and face Kane one more time. And the only way to win was for the loser to catch fire. Do you remember the finish of the Inferno match? Yep. Yeah. His it was arm. His leg or his arm? Yeah. yeah his arm went, up. went under the ring and put a big giant sleeve on his arm. Yeah. Which, which, which yeah. great, by the way. <laughs> it yeah. is great, but let me tell you something. Going into that match, I was fucking terrified. Oh, yeah. Because these people don't give a shit about anybody. Clearly As this we'll show. see when we see Mick Foley here at the end of the show. To but, be uh, fair. I was like, man, they're going to light this fucker on fire. They're going to burn him half to death and then put him out. It's going to be a disaster. To be fair. Yes. Their Inferno match, way tamer than the Inferno, Inferno matches I saw in FMW on tape well, back of course. in the day. Well, I'd hope so. Well, I was just saying, that's what, in Inferno match, that's what I envisioned. 
So the main event was Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie versus the New Age Outlaws in a cage match. So apparently at Mania, the Outlaws had been declared the winners of a match, but they had used an unofficial dumpster. That's right. I was like, what? Yep. They threw him in the wrong dumpster, and so they lost a dumpster match? So, well, they won the match, but they was ruled a, the titles were held up. Ugh. The wrong dumpster. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've, we've been to wrestling shows. There's empty dumpsters all over the place just waiting to be filled. Sure. Yeah. So, Road Dog comes out wearing a Job Squad t-shirt and referencing it in his promo just to mm -hmm. make sure everyone recognizes it. I mean, honestly, is that the most bullshit screw job in history? The wrong dumpster? <laughs> the wrong dumpster? You win by throwing your opponents in a dumpster. Oh, they threw him in the wrong dumpster. That's like a ladder match where one team wins, but it's deemed... Sorry, that was a ladder from backstage. Sorry, that was a step stool, sir. That wasn't one of the real ladders. Maybe it wasn't a false count anywhere ladder match. Or a dumpster match. So, this was, first of all, a weird visual because we're now deep in the Attitude Era. But they were still <laughs> out here in the big blue cage, which is only about eight feet tall. Uh, you cannot see what is going on in the ring between the cage and the signs. I mean, it was like... Three minutes of nothingness. So the matches, they brawled for three or four minutes. Jack took a backdrop where he flew through the air, landed against the cage, and then fell down onto his head. And then the outlaws get handcuffs. And with the handcuffs, they hook Charlie to the cage by his neck. I don't think this was Dude, Charlie, by the way. <laughs> Why are you hanging Terry Funk by the fucking neck? Yeah. Like, I know that he was standing on the bottom rope and everything like that, but... This is, like, legit dangerous. Like, if something goes wrong, how do you get the guy out of there? I don't know. By the way, for months now, he's been Chainsaw Charlie with pantyhose and, and flour on his head. And then for no reason at all, he comes out, no pantyhose on his head, wearing a Funk U t-shirt, and they refer to him as Terry Funk yeah. over and over and over again. R Ross gave up on the Charlie thing by this point. It did not go well, this whole Chainsaw Charlie experiment. I'm glad they did it, don't get me wrong, but yeah. just no rhyme nor reason why. Yeah. So Jack is isolated with his buddy chained to the cage by his neck. He's fighting on his own. He tries to climb out when DX runs out. And Walwyn grabs a chair. And he hits Foley three times in the head with a chair. Yep. First one right to the back of the head. Mm -hmm. Always nice. Yep, yep, yep. Different so, angles, too. Ah, uh, sickening. So Jack falls back into the ring. The outlaws pile drive him onto the chair. Road Dog does a worm and then pins him. Mm-hmm. So, Waltman and Hunter hit the ring. China's in there, too. They're beating the hell out of uh, Jack. They they actually... I, I, I forgot this part happened. The uh, They were uh, tied Funk to the cage in an X pose. They made him a giant X. They had claimed that Terry Funk had suffered a severed liver? Bruised liver. Kidney? Okay. Kidney, bruised kidney, yeah. I, is that why they took him out of the match completely? You wonder? They they could be. They showed his giant bruise. Yeah, it was huge. Yeah, and and they for when he was in there, Billy was punching him in the back repeatedly. Well, you know, you hurt yourself, so we'll just hang you tonight. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so, so they beat up Foley, and X Pac is the Bronco Buster, and then Hunter grabs a chair, and I mean this in the literal sense, he wraps the chair around Foley's head. Dude. What the <laughs> fuck? These fucking numbskulls. Brutal. There's gonna be more to come over the next several years. Oh yeah. Yes. And the show closed with DX celebrating atop the cage. And like I said, the wrestling on the show was terrible. But the angles and promos were all great. And this show badly needed a reset. And it got it on the show. Yep. That's memorable, raw, everybody. I think. What was that? I said it was a very memorable show. I, I think a lot of the stuff I just remember back, lots from this show, it kicks off of the era, for lack of a better term. It was the. Birth of DX 2.0, Nation 2.0, and the real birth of Austin versus McMahon. And the damn belt. <laughs> the death of the winged eagle. <laughs> God, I just want, I know this is sad. I don't even know why I bother mentioning this, but <laughs> Foley can't remember cities he's in. He has to write stuff on his hands. He's 51 years old. Mm -hmm. It's sad. It's only going to get worse. It ain't going to get better. People wrapping chairs around the guy's head. If we get, if we keep watching these retro shows, at some point we're going to see Chris Benoit take chair shots re regularly. Yeah. That's going to get no 